Uh, good evening and welcome, you beautiful, beautiful people. Uh, welcome to That Pedal Show viewers, comments and questions live. Dan here. Nick here. Hello. Nick is at the controls. He is ground control and I am mine and Tom, mine and Tom. Good, yeah. Ground control to major malfunction. <laughs> Hello everyone. Welcome to viewer comments and questions for uh, Das Pedal Show. Monday the 12th of February, just in case anyone was wondering. Yes, if you have not remembered, it is Valentine's Day, the day after tomorrow. <sighs> yes. I remembered very recently and tried to book somewhere and everywhere is sold out. Catherine and I have decided to do a uh, joint Shrove Tuesday and Valentine's Day. We're nice. Do Pancakes. Pankentine Day. Pankentine. That's, yeah. that's beautiful. I yeah. love that. There does come a time in a relationship where overt gestures of romanticism are perhaps less gratefully received than they were. <laughs> Unless you get it right, in which case always gratefully received. But if it's that kind of, oh shit, I haven't done anything. Right. On both sides, I might account. We don't need to necessarily be quite so patriarchal yeah, yeah. about it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree completely. Um, because we have busy lives. As, uh, as Shaka Khan says, what are you going to do for me? Yeah. She says, when the chips are down. <laughs> uh, hello. Uh, welcome to VCQ. If you're new, sorry. Uh, <laughs> this is sort of the shape of things. If you're not new, welcome back. Uh, you're home now. Um, uh, that's funny. Yeah. Yeah. We want to say a massive thank you to BV who is uh, in the chat there, uh, moderating and doing all the good work in there and generally upholding TPS's end. Thank you, BV, as always, we greatly appreciate it. And uh, thank you to everyone who's super chatted tonight. I've turned them off already because we are oversubscribed for super chats. If you have super chatted, you will be answered. Uh, it might just take us a little while to get there because we do have quite a lot this okay. evening. Okay, all right. Um, so we'll say hello to Andrew Jones. Hello, Andrew. Hello, Andrew. He's on. He's been to see Pete Thorne on the Classic Rock Show this week. Oh, lovely. Uh, we've Where got... are they then? They, they've been everywhere. Oh, have they? They've been everywhere, everywhere man. man. They've been everywhere. Uh, we've got uh, Isaac13 on. Never seen Isaac spelt like that before. Interesting. How's it spelled? Uh, A-I-S-A-K. Okay. Mm. Okay. Man, my dyslexia just went absolutely Full on there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. yeah. Z P Q. That. Yeah. R may as well. May as well. Yeah. That's the Welsh spelling. Yeah. <laughs> Pronounced Michael. <laughs> That'd be, actually, that's the Irish spelling, isn't it? Right. Yeah. Right. Um, Efa and. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, Iron Wolf seventeen seventy six is on. Hello. Good Sebastian English. Broll is on. He says hi all. Well, hi Sebastian. Zuta Laws. Hi gents. Eric Holkey. Good day, mate. Kevin Joe the Just. Uh, Greetings from a sunny but cold Bexel on sea. Thanks for normalising my Monday. Bless you, mate. I'll put some tents up there once. Tents up. Tents. <laughs> Reminds me of the old joke. <laughs> doctor, doctor, I feel like a teepee in a wigwam. You're too tense. <laughs> uh, yeah, I do mean tents of the pole kind. In Bexhill on Sea. Emilio White is on. Joe Halliday is on. Uh, Sebastian Brawl. Did we say him already? Hi, Sebastian. Uh, Matt McGrath is on. Plexico Duncan. Nice to hear Today, from mate. you, buddy. Uh, Tim Houston and Amish Trevedi. Freakadelic. John Triple Seven. John W Triple Seven. Gary O'Neill. Uh, Stefan Sevelda. Stefan Sevelda. Uh, who else have we got on? Chris Quinn, Steve Mass, and Robert Eboy. Hello from Hawthorne, California. <laughs> How do you spell Eboy? I B O Y. Eboy. Eboy. <laughs> Cole. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi, Cole. Hey, boy. Look at you. It's a really bad impression. If you've never seen um, Bob Mortimer's Train Guy, oh, man. you are as ever a crispy pigeon. It is just, it's the best thing. Yeah, yeah. hi, oh, hi, boy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Look yeah. at you. <laughs> it's funny. It's very funny. Train Guy by Bob Mortimer. And I apologise for my dreadful uh, 
impression. Eagle Ray Rob, hello Rob, nice to hear from you. Tony London, Greg Johnson, Todd Roy, 64 cousins. That's a lot. Yeah, but entirely possible. Mm. Uh, LC Vol 73, Ron Dark is on, says it's a bit parky in Toronto. Parky? Cold. Oh, okay. As in need of a parker. That's a really good question. Yeah, I don't know. Anyone knows the etymology of the word uh, parky? Thank you. Is etymology the right word? Uh, the study of the origin of words. Look at that. It's almost like I was a journalist once, Dan. Very uh, nice. Very Alexander nice. Roy, Alex Zanhausen, Michael Giliberto. Yeah, lots of lots of lovely friends on. Yeah, thank you so you much all. for joining us. We shall dive headlong into the uh, live chat. Let's go. Happy? Happy. How happy? I'm at about 70% happy. Oh. Yeah. That's good. It's very good. I'd take that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, reminds me of the... Um, is it the Great British Bake Off... Great British Menu? Do you ever watch that? No. Professional chefs competing... And they go in, they, after they've cooked their business, they go into a room with a professional chef and he says, so tell me about this, what would you score yourself? And they have to say, oh, you know, I'd give myself a nine. And he's like, yeah, six, mate. Okay. Eventually That's come the eventual judging. What could you have done better? And so my question is, how would, how would we fill up the extra 30%, Dan? Oh, I'm, very, I'm, I'm content. Right. And that's a really nice place. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I'm 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 very content. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm so we're happy to leave the thirty percent as headroom. Yeah, just some headroom for extra stuff. Hmm. What about you? What number would you put yourself at? Uh, it's interesting, isn't it? When you when you ask the question, <laughs> yeah, put it in numerical yeah. value. Yeah, I'd go I'd go I'd go north of seventy actually. Okay, that's nice. Yeah. No, no immediate cognitive stress, which right, I think that's is quite nice. significant. Um, yeah. I don't have to do anything this evening. That's nice. Or okay. tomorrow. I mean, apart from work, but yeah. you know, when you do what we do, it's, there's no no downside in that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no stress. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. That's I'd, nice. I just had such a great Saturday. I didn't have to do anything. Oh, wow. Like, no, I didn't have to do anything. Wow. It was just brilliant. Wow. I, wonder what that's I mean, like. I did do stuff. Yeah, obviously. But you didn't have to. You did it by choice. Yeah, I didn't have to be anywhere. I didn't have to go anywhere. Didn't have to, like... You know, anyway, uh, before we get on, let's do some housekeeping. Okay. Patrons. Uh, sorry if you turned off already. We are gabbling tonight. Patrons. Thank you to everyone who is a TPS patron, by the way. It's a really uh, effective way to support the show. And Dan and I are very grateful. Very S grateful. Second only to buying a T-shirt from that Pedal Show store. Check it out. New shirts. Yeah. New colorway in the All You Need Is Fuzz Festival edition, as we call it. Uh, anyway, Rob from Dallas in Texas. Congratulations, Rob from Dallas in Texas. You are the proud new owner of a Jam Pedals Delay Llama Extreme, which was last month's Patreon giving away, a giveaway. Um, and as soon as we hear back from you, it will get sent. And um, yeah, the new one will be announced soon enough. Beautiful. Uh, gig news. There's two shows upcoming. One is sold out, Whitney is sold out. There's still a few tickets left to the cavern. Just a reminder to anyone who has bought tickets, we don't send out physical tickets. The email confirmation is your ticket. Show it at the door, that will get you in. Uh, experience days, there are three more dates about to be announced for September, Octo October and November 24. We would like to make a heartfelt plea to anyone who's been before with the greatest of respect and the most love we can possibly muster to not come again. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it, it means so much that you guys want to come and, and so many people have uh, have come a second time and it's been brilliant. Because we have such limited availability yeah. and we want as many people as possible to experience this and it's an amazing day and that's why people want to come again. Um, but if we could kindly ask that 
we leave those spaces open for people who haven't been, yeah, that would be great. But we we would greatly appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are going to do some other days that are more focused that we will offer to previous experience day people first. Yeah. So keep an eye on your inbox for that. Anyway, thank you for that. And I appreciate it sounds a bit bad tempered, but um, it's not bad tempered. It's just we want. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. and th and to anyone that's been to an experience day, thank you. It's we're so grateful that you would come all the way and just choose to hang out with us for the day. It's really amazing. It is and awesome. we have the best day. We do. We do. We do. We do. Whit Anderson is first in this Woo. this week. Hello, Whit. G'day, mate. He says, I suggest the TPS clan by lottery tickets. Uh, despite my extreme low level of grace and soldering precision, my weekend pickup and wiring harness project worked and sounded good on the first go. <laughs> I'll take well luck done, over mate. skill. Love from Woo. That's brilliant, mate. Well done. I think we can relate to that feeling. I do remember cramming all the crap into the 335, plugging it in and going, oh, wow. Yeah, it worked. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, good on you, Wit. It's, I uh, remember the phone call going, I'm about to smash this guitar into a thousand bits. Yeah. And uh, yeah, very glad you didn't. <laughs> good on you, Wit. Uh, Iron Wolf 1776. Hello. Good day, mate. He says, the ambient sounds Dan conjures from his gear are preternet natural. Now, there's a word I don't know. Preternatural in character. Ah. I wish he would demonstrate the spells he casts to create such a hypnotic effect. When I use the same equipment, I only sterilise frogs. <laughs> I think what we're going to do with these gigs that we have coming up, we'll do a show after these gigs and go through a handful of sounds that we've created specifically for the gigs. As one of the things, you know, it's one thing to go through all the sounds on the board and say, well, I can do this and this and this. But actually, when in the heat of battle, when it comes down to it, what we're actually using and what works in the context of a band, I think will be very interesting. Not least that Dan, mine and Dan's approaches will be quite different this time around. I am deliberately not going for any of the sounds. Okay, cool. I'm going for my version of all the sounds because right. I feel that's how I'm going to be most comfortable. Yeah, I, that's all I can do. Yeah, well, except for you've got 58,000 pedals on your board. Yeah, but to, <laughs> yeah. But it's I'm I'm never chasing. I'll do things like, uh, like in Shine On, I can hear the the, the modulation and that and yeah. that stuff. It's like okay, yeah. well, what so, what's going to get me there? In in, in what's going to give me that vibe? It's all about the vibe, man. <laughs> it is fair to say, isn't it, that there are some bits that you kind of have to nail. Yeah. If you if you decided, I'm trying to think of a good example, but. If you replaced, if you're trying to do the solo in "Killing in the Name of," yeah, and you, <laughs> it'd be hard to do that a, with a slide. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You say I'm not going to do it with a whammy. I'm going to do it with a, a ring modulator. It'd be like, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Ha but, but maybe good. Um, th there's a kernel of interesting um, inquiry in what you're saying, Iron Wolf seventeen seventy six, because it is. I agree with you. You know when Dan conjures up some of those ethereal sounds it can sound so far away from anything that you, you're like how the hell does he do that and actually it's pretty simple it's once not... you break it down into its constituent yeah. parts yeah, yeah totally totally and it, the sum of the parts is greater than the individual bits. yeah yeah just on that note on a completely separate note um lo lots of people sent me well last week thank you very much i'm feeling 100 percent better um yes but just have one of those uh, nasty things on my on my throat. So yeah, but thank you all for the love. I I felt it and I do appreciate it. So thank you. Um, yeah, and had loads of very uh, really positive feedback from the show about that board. So and and of course mixed board uh, a few weeks ago. So I think that'll be an interesting show once we've done. You know we've gone through the gigs and we've worked out what's worked. I think it'd be great. My to board's go side got even by side. smaller. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yep. Yeah. Um, shall I show you? Sure. Yeah, I'm going to try. I'm going to try. We'll see what happens. Okay. We'll see what happens. This would be very interesting because there's just no way I could do. So there is, there is a space. There's a space for something that's arriving in the next couple of days that is a secret. 
Okay. It's going to go there. Right. It is a gain stage. Okay. And then this is hot swappable. Okay. So some days it might be that. Some days it might be something different. Some mm -hmm. days it might be the warthog. Whatever. That's... This is doing the meat and potatoes of everything. That and that. Okay. I've been through a couple of separate delays and reverbs, and it's like, they're great. They're really good. So far, that's all I need. Sure, okay. So we'll see. We'll, we'll see how long it lasts. Okay. I did start to go down a route of going, I want four things on a board that I can just take anywhere and do anything, and then I'll put all the clever stuff on another board mm. that, when time would allow, do that. But... I'm going to try this. Okay. I'm going to give it a go. I've been plugging my 345 into, not that, the Deluxe Reverb that was there 25 minutes ago, and just, just loving it so much. Mm. Just loving it so much. So, we'll see. Oh, yeah. We'll see. I hope it's worth it's worth a go. We'll see. I'll probably get like one song in and go. No, this ain't working. I think it'd be interesting when you start to go through the. The bits and we start to break down who's going to play what yeah um yeah i mean game wise it's completely covered there's nothing i can't do okay well with, then you're all the way with those much... with the thing that's coming and the two that are on there there's nothing i can't do game wise okay the the, the hard bit is my only wobbly is a harmonic tremolo mm. so if there has to be a rotary speaker or something somewhere then that's going to be the issue but you know what the it, the monk does yeah, I was going to say it's, it's right a bad example because it does a good rotary right, right, speaker. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, blah blah blah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Talking about myself again. Um, uh, but yes, we will. We will do that and follow up on on how they got dialed in. Uh, Joe Halliday. Hi, Joe. Nice to hear from you. Good from Hello Sailor Effects. He says inspirational show on Friday, guys. Dan's use of a compressor has been an absolute revelation. I second that. Man, that that diamond comp, forgotten how amazing that was. And then it was Johnny Marr that reminded us. He's like, yeah, that's like my secret weapon. And I thought, I've got one. I haven't plugged it in for ages. Plugged it in and was like, oh, oh this is very special. I Because... Perhaps like you, Joe, I don't know. The reason for the revelation from my end, and maybe it's the same for you, was... You know, I associate a compressor with a sound, which is that sound that I don't really want. The way Dan used it to juice up another gain stage was like, oh, that's different. Cool, isn't it? That really cool. Really does work. Yeah. Really does work. Um. Anyway, he says, uh, last week, my mate at Joe's Plays Riffs had surprise brain surgery and is now home recovering. Get well if you're watching, mate. Yeah, wow. Joe plays riffs, brain surgery. Hope it went yeah, okay. Mate, hope you're and okay. you're recovering if you are watching this. Uh, the entirety of the TPS family sends you well wishes. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. Hope you're awesome. Emilio White. Hello, Emilio. Hi, Emilio. Says, um, here's an update on my wet dry Kraken rig. Dan, kudos to the gig rig power and the humdinger. They're great. Thank you, mate. Still having that oomph from the amp with the delay is spot on, like before. Take a cue from the chat. Thank you. Okay. All right, Emilio. There has been a trend of people offering their super chats to someone in the regular chat. Uh, yes. So we will take a question from... Let's see. Come on, come on, come on. We got one from Jose... Labord it says, hi Mick and Dan, have you guys tried the Walrus Audio Polychrome Analog Flanger Pedal? Any thoughts compared to the, the Electric Mattress? The, the, the Electric Mattress. Um, so try the, the Elastic Mattress and it's, and it's great. The Polychrome Analog Flanger we don't have here. Uh, I am keen to give that a go. The... I've been a big fan of the Wars Audio modulation stuff, like the the Julia Chorus, um, I think is beautiful. And they're, they're really flexible, and they're, the guys at Wars are very clever, and some very clever things. Um, yeah, so yeah, I'd be keen to, keen to give that a go. The, the new stereo analog delay... Looks amazing. Looks incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it really does. 
Uh, John Hayes, A. John Hayes, says, uh, I'm flying over from Ireland to see Yee and Eddie Timmons in May. Oh, brilliant. What can I expect from The Hang prior to the show? Thank you so much for your amazing work. Uh, what can you expect from The Hang? Well, we'll... We all lie down. Yeah. Quiet for 45 minutes. And then we pull out BMX bikes and everyone gets to jump over us. Yeah. It's like everyone's 14 again. Yeah. Mixed at the end, though. No, we'll we'll have a general chat. Uh, we'll go through our rigs, uh, and you can see them up close and personal. Might be that one or two people get to have a little thrash through them. Yeah. Sometimes that can happen. But it's a hang, and any questions that yeah. you've got, we can just, you know... Andy will be there, obviously, and he'll demonstrate stuff and answer questions you might have for him. So, yeah, it's just uh, it's very chilled out and just, like, hanging out with a bunch of mates. Yeah. Uh, and... Shooting the Scheisser. It is very fun. Hmm. Yeah, we look forward to seeing you, eh, John? Oh, Matt McGrath. Hello, Matt. He says, leg ends. I can finally say I'm done with pedals. <laughs> now to just delete reverb. <laughs> I assume you mean the app. <laughs> uh, I've got a Fairfield 900 Fuzz. Have either of you tried one? Absolutely stellar. Paired it with Science Amp's mother preamp. Um, haven't tried the fuzz, but I've liked every single Fairfield oh, thing. Oh, yeah. Ever. Yeah. yeah. So I'm sure it's really amazing. Yeah. Their stuff is so good. There's a little pedal that they do that doesn't have the foot switch. Yeah. The, um, yeah, it's amazing. I forget what it's called, but there's one here. It's called the ODB713, but it does have another name. Yeah, it's great. I wish all companies would do versions of their pedals without foot switches. I can hear multiple company heads <laughs> yelling at you. Um, why would you do that, Dan? Why would you not want a foot switch? Um, just for the way that I use the pedals in a switcher. Mm. and it just So you just have the circuit and the switcher turns the circuit on. You don't need to go through the foot switch. So one thing I used to do, and I'm, now I've got to the point now with what... Um, so pleased with the way that everything is working. I used to hard solder the circuit straight to the board bypassing the foot switch um, just for mental clarity as much as anything. But, yeah. you know, I, I do it love also, that thing. It does mean that you can... A, a slight irony, you had a jolly great switcher to your board, so your board necessarily has to get much more massive. But of course, the functionality that gives you is huge. You couldn't do it without it. Plus, you get the signal clarity and all the things we talk about with uh, something like G3. In fact, there's nothing like G3. With G3, if you could then have switchless versions of all your pedals that were very small, mm. your pedal board could be shrunk back down to a sensible proportion. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I can only think of two switchless pedals, that one and the Boss TU3S. Oh, and the Otto BIM, but that's that big anyway. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, it, but, you know, that, that'd be cool. Would say if, um, if anything's going to go wrong in a pedal, it's usually the foot switch. It's always the foot switch. Yeah. Apart from it's always a cable, second thing is a foot switch. Yeah. Because they're just... Oh, they're nightmares. But anyway. Unless you buy the uh, Gig Rig Opto kick foot switch, Dan. We designed that because foot switches are flipping nightmares, you know. Hmm. Yeah, anyway. Uh, the, mo the Mod LB says, Wes Chilton. Thanks, Wes. There you go. And it's a small version of the Fairfield Barbershop, says Tom V. Thank you, Wes and Tom, for the clarification. Yeah, there's those... Whoever's doing the design and the listening to those circuits, they're so switched on. Mm. They're really great. Yeah, well done, mate. Uh, Neil from NRG is on. Oh, hey, Neil. Hey, hello, Neil. Hope you're well, mate. He says, uh, I've seriously considered offering my mini pedal range without foot switches. There you go. Yeah. I think what would happen is if you did a, a bit of market research, you'd probably find... If you did market research among that pedal show, you'd get very high numbers of people going, that's a really good idea. And then the second you go out into the world, it would shrink to about 0.5%, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's for a very select market. But yeah. it's a, you know, I think it's a... Um, it'd just be, help, like, personally, it'd be helpful for me. 
But anyway. Yeah, no, I get it. I get it. I get it. Oh, uh, Rev Rock says Cusack make a bunch of switches yeah. versions. There you go. Yeah, the Friar, the Brian May treble booster. Yeah, that's because it's always on, I guess. Yeah. He has his yeah. treble booster on his the strap on his guitar. So it goes out of the guitar, into the treble booster, then into the wireless. Because that the treble booster won't deal with the buffer. So it's like, okay, just stick it on the strap. S stick it on there. Brilliant. Battery will last literally for about nine months. Yep. Uh, Plexico, Duncan, hello, mate. Hey, he mate. says, uh, hey, DNM, uh, Dan, on your board, do you have the delay and reverb through the effects loop? Uh, modulations two, thank you. And hi, Mick. Hi, Duncan. Um, everything is straight in the front because I run the amps pretty clean. And even though if I dig in, specifically the matchless starts breaking up, but actually that does a pretty magical thing to those delays and reverbs. It's the nature of those specific delays and reverbs just work into those amps. So yeah, I don't, I had toyed actually the, a, a few experience days ago, I'd done the uh, send from the matches back stereo into two yeah. uh, returns. Yeah. And it was really good. Yeah. But I still prefer bang, straight bang, in. straight in. Yeah. It only stops working once you get up to a sort of significant level of gain in your, in the front end of your amp really. And then, even then, some people really like that. You know, the shoegaze crowd, for example. Um, that's not shoegaze, etc. Uh, but actually, the amp can be overdriving a little bit. Like a vintage type tube amp can be overdriving a little bit, and it, I think it still sounds great. I think, as a as a tangential example, Dan had, his, had this AC30 plugged in today. We were making some short videos, and. Uh, one of the things this AC30 does when you hit it hard is you get an audible note from the transformer. <laughs> In the it's same... just like, I want to play too. I let me sing along. <laughs> yeah, quite a lot of quite a lot of old amps did it. Like the the Laney um, that supergroup back there does it. Yeah, and it and. Back in the day, it was all the stuff I just really didn't like about vintage amps. I was like, why is it doing that? And it's all this histrionic and extra mess and muck around the edge that is the opposite of clean and pristine and lovely. And when you hear it in the room, it's like, mm, yeah, I'm not, I don't love that. When you hear it recorded, it's like, oh, there's the source. Yeah. You know, they probably didn't add that to the Helix model of the, or maybe they did, I don't know, but... It, that's the source and to, to long story short i think that whole thing about you know maybe a delay in a reverb hitting a slightly overdriving amp and all the sort of overtones and extra harmonics that it creates is is the source yeah yeah it's a very uh, by cool source thing. i mean you know source you put on stuff not the source that comes out of the ground do you ever watch um first we feast no it's an amazing show where Sean Evans, a great interviewer, and whoever his research team is, they're amazing because they ask the best questions of any interview series I've ever seen. But they sit down with their guests and they have to eat 10 hot wings, getting hotter and hotter. <laughs> in, and they have, I mean, they've had megastars on there. I, well, I, I've seen the hot wings thing that gets millions and millions of views on Instagram. Yeah. Is that it? That's it. Yeah. Yeah. It's... it's Phenomenal, yeah, yeah. and and uh, just made me think of adding the sauce because they have to have a the, the last dab, but the, the very last wing <laughs> after they have just blown their brains out, they, they have a bit of they have to put a bit of extra extra hot sauce in that last wing. But anyway, there you go. That is the twenty first century encapsulate, isn't it? There we are. It's like sorry, the content isn't interesting enough. What we need to do is add hilarity through eating stuff you shouldn't eat. Yeah, Noel's been on there. It's so good. This is where we're heading, people. Um, K. Ernström, Ernström, two umlauts. How metal is that? One name, two umlauts. Ern, Ernström. He'll say, no, that's completely wrong. Anyway, hello, K. Uh, hello, Leggins. Someday I will buy a QMX8. But I like to use wah after my gain stages and before my wobble. How do Sorry, I... you'd like to use wah after your gain stages and before you wobble? Okay, yes. How do I use a wah wah with the QMX? You QMX to... is Dan's uh, single loop switcher. Yeah, so if you want to use it after the gain stages, you simply put it in a loop after the gain stages. Depending on how many gain stages you want, you might have your gain stages 
if you've got four game stages, you might have a QMX4 and then into the looper and then into another QMX for other things. Um, but yeah, if it's strictly in series. So game stages first, wire pedal in a loop, and you can either leave it turned on, but I think what you'll find really interesting is a difference actually when you take the wire out of the the signal chain and see if you notice a difference, which I'm going to go out and let me say you probably will. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, the other benefit of that, of course, is depending on what kind of wire you've got, some people find stepping forward on the wire and turning it on and off a bit of a hassle. If you are one of those people, or more likely, the adjuster on the front of your wire's got a bit mis adjusted and you have to stamp on it or it turns on at the drop of a pin you won't have to turn it on and off anymore you can just turn it on and off from the QMX and then use it as you would or you can leave it on all the time in the QMX leave that loop on all the time and use the switch on the wire so you've just got a bit of added functionality well this is interesting Nick uh, Artem uh, I can't pronounce uh, anyway, it says, hey, Mick and Dan, do you have any thoughts on 70 strap pickups, the flat pole ones? I have a 79 strap, but I think the pickups are weak, or should I say microphonic. Do you have any suggestions? What happened to strap pickups in the 70s? I sort of check out about 72, 73, right. 74. Okay. So I don't really know right. is the answer. Um, they did get pretty weak. Okay. By all accounts. Uh, obviously, late 60s, Jimmy era guitars have a certain sound that we know very well. That sort of seemed to stay into the very early 70s. Then they started to change. And I, I, just, I just don't know, I'm sorry to say. I would, um, unless you love the sound of the guitar, I wouldn't be too worried about swapping them out in a guitar of that period. Um well, actually, it's true for any guitar. If you don't love the sound of it and the pickups are microphonic or not functioning properly, either get them repaired, rewound, or get new ones. Mm. And it might be that you could, if they are microphonic and there's something electronically not ideal, you might be able to go to s somebody and have them rewound. And talking to someone like that would make sense because they really do know what they're talking about and they can advise you on a on a direction of travel. Mm. Yeah, as for flat pole, stagger pole, I just, I've never looked into it. I know Jason Lawler is a massive advocate of saying they should be flat. And I think his standard um, offering on all strap pickups is flat. All right, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, and I, I don't know. I don't know about that. Uh, I just don't know enough about it. I, if They need to be staggered so they look right for me. Right. And then we'll worry about the sound after that. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, all my favourite Strat tones ever, ever have been made using staggered pickups. Right. Because that's how they were. There you but, go. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, sorry I can't be more use on that. I, I I, actually don't know. I've heard lots and lots of pickups from the late 50s th into the early 70s, and I, I can pigeonhole them in a, in the broadest of terms. After that, I'm, I'm afraid I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, opinions on the... Fender Blues Deluxe is a pedal platform, says Carl Nielsen. Uh, yes, brilliant pedal platform. So what is the Blues Deluxe? Because I get confused. It's what the Hot Rod Deluxe was before they added the channel that nobody uses. Oh, so it's a 40 watt amp. It's, it's basically a pre-Hot Rod Deluxe, Hot Rod Deluxe. And actually, those of you who like the Blues Deluxe, some other differences as well. But the clean channel, essentially. So it's still a 1x12? Same thing. Tweet. Okay. Oh, really? Yeah, really cool machine. So a difference between that and the DeVille? 212 or 410 is the DeVille. Okay. And the uh, Deluxe is always 112. Okay. Yeah. Like the Blues Deluxe, okay. And, and a lot of people say that without the extra more gain circuitry or whatever the third channel was, they sound a bit sweeter for it. Right. Because they don't have all the extra guff in them. And what was the 10-inch one? 4x10 was also a DeVille. So, but there was a single 10, wasn't there? There's oh, that's a Pro Junior. The Pro Junior. Okay, yeah. so the Blues Deluxe 1x12, 40. Okay, yeah, Tweed. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, that's in the in the Hot Rod series, as they were called. And obviously, the Blues Deluxe wasn't in the Hot Rod series because it hadn't been invented yet. Um, 
but yeah, Blue Deluxe. I think they, I think they even reissued the Blue Deluxe. Right. Yeah. Cool machine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great, great pedal platform. Like loads of clean headroom, lovely reverb. Happy days. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, also, the other thing I really like about the Blue Deluxes and the Hot Rods is they do have quite the mid-range. They're not scoopy like a Deluxe. Okay. Uh, uh, sorry, a Deluxe Reverb. At lower volumes, they've got that mid-range kick, which in order to get out of a Deluxe Reverb, you you have really, to turn you've up, got yeah. to turn it up. That's yeah. interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Are they... Are they I've heard of them. I'm assuming they must be very popular, a Blues Deluxe. Uh, yeah, I mean, before the Hot Rods, that it was they it was were the, everywhere. Yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah. Marvin is desperate to know what we think of the Eventide H90. Um, you must be new, Marvin, and welcome. Um, Dan and I are not a fan uh, for one principal reason is that it doesn't have analog dry through, which means we can't use it in the kind of rigs that we use. Dan and I use uh, a wet dry situation, so it means time based effects tend to go and modulations and stuff tend to go to one amp only. And if you have a digital pedal that has no analog dry through, it means that there's latency between the two, it adds latency. And it means you can never get them properly in phase, so it always sounds out of phase. Now, if you're running the H90 stereo, it wouldn't matter because the the latency would be on both sides, and that would be completely fine. And you've only got to look at pedal boards around the world to see how popular mm. the H90 and the H9 are. They are phenomenally popular as yep. Swiss Army knife um, type devices that can do a whole heap of things uh, pretty well. Yeah, but. Yeah, I'm not a fan. Um, I don't want anything that 100% converts my signal. Yeah. No, I'm, and I'm the same. I, I remember they were, so we were going to do a show with a couple of things, and Mick was getting into it, and he had it kill dry in a, in a mixer, and some of those wet reverb sounds were it's just spectacular. Beyond yeah. spectacular. Yeah. So the... That sort of stuff is amazing. And I used the H9, I've still got it, used it for a long time, specifically for harmonies and that sort of thing. Um, and it had a sound and it was really cool. But I've, for the, my, the way my rig works as well, I yeah. need to have an analog drive through. George Skelly and Scott Gaylor are saying, but you know, couldn't you run the bypassed H90 in the dry side uh, to take care of the latency, number one. So essentially, do, yeah, get latency on both sides and therefore it's not a problem. You could, if you love the H9, if you love the sounds in the H90 enough that you didn't want to be without them, then yes, you could absolutely do that. Uh, for me, it was twofold. A, I didn't like the sound of the thing bypassed. It, it really, really altered the sound in a big way. Um, and secondly, I didn't love the sounds enough to want to keep them. But you may well, and you know, if you love those sounds, that's all. It's just purely personal. Scott Gaylor says, I thought Dan solved it with a loop switcher. Yeah, Dan makes something called the Wetter Box, which means it is basically its own parallel mixer, which means you can run something like the H90 dry, on, uh, wet only, sorry, and mix it back in with your own dry signal. So you, you essentially create a parallel analog dry through you create your own parallel analog dry through but i opened up my board one day and just thought this is insane this is like having a trailer for my 911 to carry my logs in when i should just buy a pickup right you know yeah sure it's like it's not what it's for yeah yeah so um and, and I would just, I would reiterate, there are those of you out there that love the sounds in the H90 and what it can do. I mean, it is, the process in power in it is it's incredible, unbelievable. Yeah. The harmonising stuff, the pitch shifting stuff, not to mention all the extra algorithms they added for delays and reverbs and various and that, modulation effects. E, that's even tied strength, right? They're, um, they've been in that game a long time. And I remember when the H3000 first came out and Satch and Vi and everyone was using them and you know it was such a game changer yeah. for those those sorts of things and and they haven't stopped with that stuff you know they and the H90 is the latest in their um, algorithm bonanza and it's an amazing piece of gear you know 
I must say, coming from someone who used the H9, I was fairly au fait with the H9, and it took me a while to get... The H90 is so far beyond. Yeah, I couldn't. The 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 UI, I would have had to do another few weeks of it, and mm. there's some UI I just get. Yeah. And I, I often get called a Luddite. I use a great deal of extremely complex software. I do quite a lot of complex computational stuff. I'm not an idiot. But when it comes to pedals and effects, if they're not immediately easy to fly, mm. I am going to crash. Mm. It's as simple as that. Because in a performance environment... Thank you, I'm out. Yeah, I, I need to be doing this thing that is involving the audience, not looking at my damn pedal board all night. So, But yeah, sounds amazing. Um, loads of people use them. Great Swiss Army knife. You know, if you look at Josh Smith... Uh, Paul Stacey, mm -hmm. um, friends of ours who do have the brains that can handle them and use them in incredibly creatively, then, yeah, I think the if we were in court, the jury would find against me. But uh, it nevertheless remains my my position on it. Dormat says, the only person I hear call Mick a Luddite is Mick. No, I get called it a lot in the comments. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Whenever I say anything like I don't like MIDI or... It's oh, like, okay. I've, I've yeah, yet yeah. to see it. Yeah. So. And it's a misunderstanding of what the Luddites were anyway, but that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> 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 okay. The Luddites didn't hate technology. They just didn't want to starve. And there is a difference. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Uh and just to add a final bit of context for that, my favourite rig at the moment is this into a deluxe reverb. Right. So that might give you the context <laughs> required for that last conversation. I'm definitely on a simplification. Um, That's nice. Trip at the moment. Yeah. And it will go. It will come back. It always does. That's how we work, isn't it? We come in and out of things that we're trying. Sorry, I'm talking about myself yet again. Uh, watch, in a few weeks, we're going to have, I think it's going to be on March the 1st. Mm -hmm. I think it is. There's a show with John Smith. John came in last week and we filmed with him. Mm -hmm. John's been on the show once before. Uh, and if you go to a gig and you watch John, what you will see is a bearded man singing folk songs with an acoustic guitar. And then you hear it and you realise it can't just be that. If you look on the floor, there's a Zoya. What else did he have? Uh, there's a... Big Sky, Blue Sky. No, Big... El Capistan, Blue Sky. Yep. Uh, into a... Quad cortex. Quad cortex with it into a G, th like all in a G3, and he's triggering samples and distorted <laughs> delays. And uh, I mean, it's just. It's astonishing. It's amazing. It's the um, a, a brilliantly creative application of the technology in a musical environment. He, like hearing those songs yeah. with, with those sounds is like, that's okay. That's where this can go. Yeah. You can be so creative and actually do music. Yeah. Which is so all to wonderful. say it's down to how you drive it, isn't it? To yeah. go back to the car analogy, ultimately. Um, and I just want to say personal thanks to Neve for making stuff that helped John sound so good. <laughs> Honestly, I just did my first post-production job on his vocal and guitar using proper analog outboard. And I'm like, oh. That didn't take very long. No, amazing. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, clab, clabber p, clabber p. Uh, I saw that Swade's Richard Oaks has a gig rig pedal board. Ah, oh, lovely. It would be so great if you could have him on your show. I will reach out. And that see would if be he nice. Wants to come up. Yeah. That would be really nice. Um. I guess he took over from Bernard at some point, did he? I, yeah, I guess so. I mean, I, I didn't... I This is the first I've heard about it, so I will reach out and yeah, see. Yeah, no, I'm aware of Richard. I'm aware of, of who he is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that'd be lovely. Yeah, brilliant. I'll, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'll see if I can 
find out who his people are and see if he wants to come on. Yes. Uh, Kem Navarro says, Dan, please can you write an EP with Danish Pete? <sighs> I, I there's nothing that I could add to Danish Pete on an EP. I will say though, I have got um, I sent the rough mixes over to Paul Stacy. He's given a couple of notes. Um, he wants this. Wants to be, yeah. He's like <laughs> you are choking that yeah. Um, it's actually very complimentary it's, and and. There's a couple of little bits and pieces. I need to re-record the drums on one track. Um, so I'll find out a way to do that. And a couple of vocals, and then he can mix it. Nice. Which would be great fun. So are we still doing vocals? I'd love to do vocals yeah, yeah, yeah. at some point. Yeah, yeah, If that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Green Machine, 1975. Nice quick question. He says... Uh, Hello, gents from Ber Berkeley, California. What artist or band are you really into at the moment? I want to do a deep dive into the music of a new artist. Oh, yeah. Brilliant. Um, Madison Cunningham. Yeah. Madison Cunningham is who I'm into. Latest album, Revealer. Yeah. Revealer. Madison Cunningham. There you go. Yeah. Amazing. And I just want to add Sarah Jaros. J-A-R-O-S-Z. Or ZS, can't remember which way around it is. She's just released a new record called Polaroid Lovers. Right. But there was a record she did called The Blue Heron Suite, which is an utterly remarkable piece of music. The Blue Heron Suite by Sarah Jarose. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I've been listening to a lot of Kurt Rosenwinkel recently. And Especially he's just watching clips of him live. And um, Kurt said his next time he's in the UK, he's going to come on the show, uh, which will be flipping amazing. Uh, so he's definitely, you know, worth uh, a listen. Julian Lage. Uh, wow. I, and, I, and I didn't get Julian the first time. It took me a couple of listens. And then there was a couple of moments that gave me context for the rest of his playing. Yeah. You fit a way in. Yeah. And, yeah. I'm, and it's like, and it just like, and it, the, the light was on. And then it's like, oh man, his, his use of melody and just harmonic knowledge. He's so musical with it. And then he'll come up, then he'll, rip out this thing and it's just like it's fire mm -hmm. and it's like it's just beautiful is there any singing in it uh no not the stuff that i'm listening to but the, you know I, I haven't listened to to all of this stuff but yeah he's there's a trio again it's a lot of a lot of his live performances and there's a great interview he yeah, does with yeah, with yeah. uh rick beato Seeing him do that stuff live um, is is astonishing. Um, yeah, I'm sort of really getting into the more I'm practicing and trying to work out harmony. And when I hear guys like Julian and, and Kurt, it's like oh, that's where that's that's where it can go. That's Julian Large, uh, Large L A G E, and Kurt Rosenwinkel uh, is phonetic, R O S E N, Winkle, Kurt Rosenwinkel. Yeah, just just yeah. I've yeah. gone the opposite way. I can't. I'm struggling to listen to guitar players at the moment. Okay. Yeah, I'm just I'm on a sort of a bit of an anti-guitar. I think it comes down to the whole simplifying the rig thing, and I go uh, through okay. that where I just can't listen to guitar music for a while. Yeah, sure. And then. All of a sudden, in two months, I'll put on a Wayne Krantz record and that's all I'll listen to. Yeah. So it's funny, isn't it, how it goes? I just want to hear songs at the moment. I want to hear I want to hear simple diatonic melody. Right. That's nice. Yeah. That's nice. You know, Julie Andrews. <laughs> um... Uh, Legends says Freakadelic. 
Hello, Freakadelic. Good Leggings. Mate. I dipped my toe into wobbly stuff with a Marshall RG1 and it killed my top end. Could this be a power issue? What's an RG1 then? So look. RG1. RG. Regenerator. What's that? A rotary speaker? Modulation? Chorus and phaser. Okay. Yeah, um, so I don't. Some choruses, particularly old analog choruses, can be very dark sounding and don't have a lot of top end. C2, very, very dark sounding thing. Um, I'm going to assume that this probably isn't analog, but it might be. Um, can usually tell by the power consumption. 300 milliamps, so no. Yeah, be... it's going to be digital. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Dan? <laughs> it's... Okay. This is, again, this is just me, because I've heard people do wonderful things with um, digital modulation. Whenever I go into that world, I always find that I... The transient just goes, it's very hard to get that transient right digitally, I feel. I just haven't heard it done right, which is why I still use analog chorusing, that analog vibrato, that old diamond analog vibrato, um, the harmonious monk. For modulation, for me, I'm yet to hear a digital version of that stands up to any analog modulation. Now it and it can be noisier, it can be darker, but you know, I like when I listen to the Electric Mistress and the edge on that thing. Yeah. It's just it's like it, it just doesn't get any better for me. It can keep it can get different. Yeah. But it's like but that's that's as for me it's as best the best I've heard. Yeah, yeah. And when it comes to the doing the, the digital stuff, especially the digital multi stuff, it's I've always felt you might find blanket land yeah you might find one of those algorithms is amazing um, but for me they're just all a little bit compromised um, so I would if you want to get into wobbly stuff and you know that's a large term find a bit of music that has an effect on it that you like it might be a phaser or whatever and just go down if like for example if it's a phaser just go down and grab a one of the new MXR Phase 90s and plug it in and just have a listen. That's why I still like guitar shops because they still will have these things that they, you know, you can go and have a play and have a listen and, and see what you think. And it's for me, analog modulation every day. It's just, yeah. 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 So what's happening is your sound's getting all syrupy and wrapped up in that chorus and phaser. And yeah, you're losing some of the transient on the front of the uh, of the note. What might be cool is if you had any option to run that wet dry, so you run that into one amp and keep another amp without it. That will give you your um, give you your attack back. Mm. And then just mess around with the mix and depth settings on the modulation. It might be that you could set it more subtly. Um, there might be a buffer option that you can turn on. I don't know, but yeah, just try all the options on the pedal and see if it can if it can work. Um, and of course, change the settings on your amp. If you want it a bit more trebly, turn the treble up on your amp. And obviously, the problem there comes when you turn it off again and it's too trebly. But yeah, yeah, just don't be afraid to um, go to extremes of settings and and see if there's something in there you can love. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, honeyed bluegrass. Honey, honeyed bluegrass says you should check out Molly Miller. I just came across her. Wonderful, fun jazz guitar. Yeah, I met Molly uh, last year in. Anaheim. Oh, really? She's just a monster player. Absolute monster player. Um, you had so Eagle, much fun without me. <laughs> Eagle Ray Rob says, John Leventhal's Rumble Strip is amazing. It's his first solo release. Uh, he's produced and played on lots of other artists. Sean Colvin, Mark Cohen. Yeah, I know John Leventhal through Sean Colvin. I am a massive Sean Colvin fan. Mm. And he was... Well, he was, they were together for a long time, but he was also the producer and guitar player. Is Whenever he 
plays that particular kind of um, compressed telly type sound or whatever guitar it might be, it is so uniquely him. Right. That that particular way he approaches that compression sound. Mm. He's flipping brilliant. John Leventhal, for anyone who didn't get that. Um, I don't, is that a new record, Rob? If it is, I, I want to hear it. Yeah. Love him, love him, love him. Um, James, bless you. you uh, I, I've just worked out what you're asking. You very kindly invited me and Dan to your 50th birthday. I don't think we'll be able... I definitely can't make it. I doubt Dan will be able to make it because it's a weekend and uh, our weekends tend to be full of... Making up for the stuff we didn't get done during the week. Yeah, yeah. It's very kind of you to offer me. Thank you, man. Thank That's you so really much. That's really kind. Um, but yeah, I... Uh, how can I say this? I don't even go to my own family's parties or indeed my own most of the time because if there's an option to stay in, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to take it. <laughs> sorry to be so... Sorry to be so... Whatever about it. Um, um, let's see. Amish Trevady. Hello. Amish, how are you? He says, have never found a distortion I enjoy. But I've never tried a rat. If you were to recommend one, knowing I may not enjoy it, what would you recommend? <laughs> so, right. I'm working with an artist at the moment and he's looking for... He wants to try out a bunch of uh, overdrive pedals and gain stages because the overdrive pedal that he's had in his board has had forever... And he wanted to see what else was out there. We tried, must have tried, 20 really awesome overdrives and just kept coming back to that thing that he's so comfortable with. And there was nothing that sounded, uh, a couple of things that sounded great but felt a bit different. But he was after a very specific thing that he wanted it to do so it comes down to what are you wanting it to do so it's one thing to say i want an overdrive pedal but another thing to say well i want something that's going to punch my amp that's sort of breaking up a little bit and give it some more harmonics and texture or i've got a clean amp and i want to be able to do metal tones or i've got um you know i've got one overdrive pedal that does my uh sort of crunchy tones I want a rock thing I think if you can if you can ask the question and you know what is it that you want it to do it'll give you a better place to start um because it depends on so much the guitar the amp the way you setting the amp are you are you playing loud enough that the amp is working hard is it clarity that you want? Is it real limiting thing? It's such a broad thing you're after. That, that, sorry, that statement of trying to find another overdrive. Now, to caveat that, all I would say as well is sometimes you find that thing you're looking for in the most unlikely of places. The SD9 for me, you could have, I would have bet a million pounds the day before we tried that, that that would not have been the overdrive I was after. But hearing it in that context with my rig, with the drive turned down, the level turned up, it was like, oh. it was astonishing. So, in the spirit of, of experimentation, never stop trying stuff. But if you can identify what it is that you're, what that one of that other game stage to do, that will put you in a good place to start. Yeah. And rest. I'll reiterate what Dan said earlier about. Uh, there was a question about modulation effects. It might be that you could listen to, if you could identify some music with distortion in that you like, then understanding what that type of distortion is, because then you have some context for it. Mm. For sure, you know, there you are sat in your room with your lovely clean stratty sound and you've got the position two, whatever it is you like, and it's lovely and bell-like and clear, and, and then you step on a distortion pedal and it kind of, it shrinks in on itself, mm. it becomes nasal and raspy and horrible. And there's no context for it, so I totally understand why you might not enjoy that. But if you hear it in the context of music, and that, I mean, flipping heck, that could be anything from punk rock to Metallica to Albert King to, you know, most 
Hmm. Fight me in the comments. Most guitar music is overdriven mm -hmm. to some degree, to some degree. You know, even B.B. King, if you listen to Live at the Regal, it ain't clean. Yeah. Shadows when they were cooking. Yep. Not clean. Absolutely. So there's some kind of overdrive somewhere and that's where the harmonic interest. Now, don't get me wrong. There are exceptionally beautiful clean guitar sounds and we love them. I will think I'll give you a uh, communicate by Dire Straits to kick you off. But there are endless examples of lovely clean guitar sounds. But actually, most rock and roll has got a bit of grit on it. Mm. So if you could pick out some of that that you like, hone in on what's making that noise that might be some context that will help you get there. Yeah. And as for a recommendation, Dan, do you have a recommendation? A hot pedal cake. to try? Hot <laughs> cake. Crowther Audio hot cake. <laughs> um, I just, whenever I, I, I might not use it for a year. Whenever I kick it on, it's like, oh, it's so good. I also love the way that that thing sounds being boosted into. It reacts like an amplifier. You put a, a, a treble booster into a hot cake and it just sounds absolutely glorious. I'm going to say... Oh, it's so hard. Where do you even begin? And you specifically said a distortion pedal. I'm not going to recommend the SD9 because it is a pain in the butt. <laughs> um, it's so hard, isn't it? It is. And a rat. A good... rat. Yeah. Uh, yeah, get a rat because... The great thing about the rat is it has the filter control, which enables you to just place the the voice of it hmm. in in a place that you'll find enjoyable. Our favourite rat, Dan and I's favourite rat, is the Jam Pedals Rattler. It's so good. It's so 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 yeah. good. So Jam Pedals Rattler. There you go. Good luck. Yep. <laughs> Uh, Stefan Savelda. Hi, Stefan. He says hi, DNM. I recently purchased a Poly Bebo. For wet effects, it's so great for learning signal paths. Mm. The only issue is no analog dry through. Can you solve the latency issue with a wetter box and kill dry? So you can. Um, the only thing is, when you're talking about things like vibrato and uh, things like that, it's important to remember vibrato. Even so, let's say you have an analog vibrato, right? you're going to have latency because the whole thing with that effect is it's 100% wet. It go, it's going through... A digital a, vibrato. No, an analog vibrato. What? An analog vibrato is going to have latency because it's based on the time of oh, a delay chip, right? Yeah. So, that, that, mm. but what I'm saying is when you mix that together with the dry symbol, it becomes absolutely freaking glorious. Um... It depends on what the what the Bebo is doing. So things like if you tremolo and vibrato and stuff, you know, having a, a dry signal in that can be um, can have another problem because you know with a tremolo, if if you want a hundred percent wet tremolo that goes in and out, then having a dry signal in there all the time is going to is not going to be what you want. <laughs> However. If what you want to do is have a dry signal and mix a wet signal on top of that dry signal, then absolutely, that will work great. Um, I think uh, Loki from PolyFX is a genius. The he, reverb is absolutely incredible. Um, that, that came out and also the Mercury X came out. So we are going to do film a show next week. You okay? Got some new jeans. Oh, okay. I, it, for some reason, you know I, what? I, I saw the pink on the end of the of your charger, and I saw. And I, I looked at your hands, and I thought I saw blood. No, they're just they, you go blue when you've got new jeans. Oh, you? okay. You know that thing where the dye. I I no my jeans. I've never had jeans that have leave dye on my legs or my hands from touching them. Really? No, never. Do you never buy like indigo jeans then? Uh, I have, but I've never had. I've never gone. Look at my new jeans. Uh, now oh, right. I'm blue. No, they do. They do. If they're especially if they're raw denim or unwashed. I mean, I probably have. I just never noticed. Yeah, you just. <laughs> I just. You get home and Martin's like, "Are you all right? You've got a bit blue, mate." Sorry, I completely interrupted you. 
What are you talking about? Uh, analog drive through. Yeah. 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 So yeah, if if what you want is an uh, an analog drive through with zero latency and then mix that stuff on top, mm. yes. Also, I don't. Apologies if you said this, but if you're not running wet dry, if you're running stereo or straight mono, it doesn't matter because the latency is so short. You you. Well, <laughs> most people don't notice it. So uh, it's not an issue. <coughs> if you're running stereo or, you know, you're not mixing it with something that's dry, it's really not an issue. Or it's less of an issue. Oh, Sean Tubbs is in the chat. Hello, Sean. G'day, mate. Hope you're amazing. I always, whenever I see Sean has got a video up playing something, I'll, I will, no matter what I'm doing, I'll excuse myself and I'll go, go and watch the Sean yeah, Tubbs video. Yeah, yeah. I just love Sean's playing so much. It's so yeah. beautiful. It's like, it's a bit like watching Book of Back, isn't it? You can't do too much of it. Right. Because the more you do, depressing. it's like, maybe this isn't for me anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, G Barge. Hello, G. G'day, mate. Uh, actually, G is not here because he's walking a dog. He says, uh, Dear gents, love Friday's show. We'll miss today's VCQ due to dog walking duties. Okay. Uh, please allow me to join the budding TPS tradition of yielding my time to one of our mates in the live chat. Cheers I yield my time. Yeah, there we go. So uh, let's um, let us see uh, if I can find a question. Uh, I'm going to go back to the next question that is not a comment, that is actually a question. This is, one, this is a good one. Martin Rowland says, how do you feel about preamp pedals in the effects loop? You may have addressed it in the past and I missed it. Um, that's really interesting. So... I think we did more than address it. We did. We've done... We nailed that. I don't think oh, very think. many people were doing it before we did it. Right. There you go. I'm going to be that arrogant and say that. I'm not saying nobody was. I'm not saying nobody was. There was a tradition in the 80s where, from in the rack effects, where you'd have, um, you might have, might be the ADA MP1 or the Marshall JMP1 or the uh, Mesa Boogie, uh, what was that thing called? The, oh, the rack thing, which is. There was loads of them. There Carvin so, did one. Yeah, ADA yeah, yeah. did one. Yeah, groove tube. Everyone did yeah, a tube. Yeah, everyone, and it was basically a preamp, Chandler, in in a rack thing, and then you would come out of the preamp, go into your wet effects, and then back into a power amp, a dedicated power amp section, and then into your stereo rig or however you're running it, and then some one day, a gentleman running one of those things went. There's an old deluxe reverb there. What happens if I just plug at the front? He went, oh, oh my goodness, really that's good. amazing. <laughs> and so come the late, uh, come the, yeah, mid to late 90s, we started gravitating back towards simpler rigs. Valve amp, plug in the front, sounds glorious. Yeah, I think, I think Guns N' Roses had a lot to do with that. Mm-hmm. I, I think, think that was the start of getting back there. Nirvana, yeah, all that. Yeah, it started yeah. with Guns N' Roses. Yeah. And they're like, oh, there's a rock band. Yeah. Doing rock band things. And then uh, what happened in, out of Seattle happened in 1990, 91. Right. And not just Nirvana, by the way. The whole thing that mm. was there, whether it was Soundgarden or Pearl Jam or Mother Love Bone or all the other great bands that came out of there. Scott Gaylor, James uh, Richmond, Triaxis. Thank you very much. Yes, the mess of all your And then, of course, Britpop happened. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And so it was there like, was, no messing. There was a, a massive reversion from spandex-clad rack systems mm. to dude in duffel coat and playing a Sheraton through a Marshall Valve State. And it was much more about the song. Yeah. And people were connecting with it on a different level. And it was like... And it was what we needed, I think, to push music forward. Now, what's happened then, I think Mesa still had their, with their combos and, and heads and things, they will still have quite complicated multi-channel uh, preamps. Oh, are you forgetting what happened in 1991, Daniel? Actually, it might have been just before that. Total revolution in the amp market. Dual rectifier. The dual rectifier. Changed yeah. everything. Right. 
and that was a multi-channel thing though, right? Yeah. And and we'd gone from, you know, these overdrive pedals are really good. And then actually the gain stage in my amplifier also sounds really good, but how do I get I don't want delay going in the front. So then we get blah blah blah, you know, effects loops, all that stuff. Anyway. Uh, a bunch of companies started making these amazing valve preamps. Um, Effectrode, Kingsley, uh, just to name a couple. There's a there's there's a bunch, but you could actually have these preamps in a pedal that are every bit as good as a preamp in an amplifier. So what you could do then is say say you've got a single channel amplifier like a hot rod. Uh, not a hot rod deluxe, like a blues deluxe. If it had an effects loop, I can't remember if it did. It right. probably did. It Let's probably say it did. has an effects loop. Well, then you could go from having uh, just the, the blues deluxe, then having this other preamp or more than one preamp and being able to switch between them. So it's actually a really great way to do it. And we've, um, there's a wonderful. Uh, designer Simon Jarrett, who we've had in the show a bunch of times, extraordinary guitar player, and he designs these valve preamps, and we've done it loads by just plugging into the effects loop of amplifiers, and it is a glorious way yeah. of you know having real valve preamp tone, and then being able to use your yeah. digital effects and stuff, and then back into the preamp. As a matter of fact, the basis of Mick's new board is one of those. Preamps. Yeah, and before the current board, which is really stripped back, my previous live rig, which I used on the Andy Timmons dates last time, was exactly that. Some Kingsley preamps into a Mesa 5050 stereo power amp, which is there, and uh, and some cabs. So I was I was doing that exact thing and really loved it. Gonna answer Michael Gable's question because it is relevant to your question as well. Um who is looking for recommendations for a $1,000 amp for Blues Rock. He is currently using a DeVille, Fender Hot Rod DeVille 212. Right. Uh, and he's replaced that V1 with a 12 AY7, which is uh, something we suggested in one of our videos, which is really working for him. And that is relevant to your question. Uh, you picked it out, didn't you? This question that we're answering? Yes. Can you remember the gentleman's name? I will tell you the gentleman's name. Sorry, this is relevant to your question because Michael, your question is, can you spend a thousand dollars on an amp, good blues rock amp, and get a significant improvement over a hot rod Deville? And you know what? I don't think you can. Yeah. You can get something different for sure. If you want an AC30 type sound, then get an AC30 custom classic or whatever they're called now. The Chinese made one with the master volume. Really, really good traditional Vox sound. Lovely reverb and tremolo sounds great. You could buy a Marshall. Well, actually, you probably can't in the US. Here, you could buy a Marshall for a thousand for a thousand pounds because they're much cheaper here than they are in America. You know, you could get into a secondhand Doctor Z. Probably, you mm. could get. There's loads of other ways you could go, but could you really improve on a Deville? Unless you hated it, because there's plenty of people that hate the Deville, right? They don't like the mid-range character. They, it's too kind of bright and loud and clean and strident for them. But for Dan and I, that is a great big benefit because yeah. it gets you heard. Martin so Rowland is his name. Martin. Martin, Martin so what I would suggest, Michael, unless you do specifically want to turn left on the basic core tone of the thing, yeah. i.e. go Voxy, go uh, Black Panel Fendery, go you know, in a specific different direction, I would say your best option is to buy something like a Kingsley Jester or a really nice valve pre mm. and run it straight into the effects loop of that amp because the power section, the speakers, everything else about the DeVille is pretty yeah, decent. Yeah, it definitely. Pretty decent. And you can do a huge amount of front end shaping using a really nice valve preamp. The further benefit of that, and this comes into the, the original question, is if you're going somewhere and there's backline supplied, there's a 70% chance it's going to be a deluxe or a DeVille. Yep, no matter what you put on the sheet, that on, on this is what I require. Yeah, or it might be a Marshall DSL, or it might be something else. Your sound is 
is essentially sorted right from your board. Mm -hmm. So you can go into the effects loop return of pretty much any amp and be nearer than you would be if you were just plugging pedals into a completely unfamiliar amp. Yeah. So we are big fans of it. Very much so. Yeah, I don't do it anymore because I've got... Um, well, I do do it sometimes, but I've got a couple of amps that I am just deeply, deeply in love with and don't need to do it because coming back to your question, can you spend $1,000 and significantly approve on a Hot Rod DeVille? I'm not sure you can. The amp that I love is like... Cough, mortgage, more money. And there are some days where I'd still prefer a DeVille. Right. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think you could... You could upgrade the speaker, maybe, if you yeah. wanted to do that. Yeah. And that would have, you know, the V1. Yeah. You know, there are things that you can do to improve it. But um, if, if it, the other problem you might be having is that it's too big and too heavy and too loud, in which case, well, that's a different question. Um, that is a different question. But yeah, totally. Yeah. I, I like what Dan says about speaker. Yeah. But I, again... Michael Landau, right? P probably my favourite guitar player, but certainly up there. More often than not, he's using a Hot Rod DeVille. Right, wow. His version thereof. Mm. So, yeah, good luck. Good yeah, good luck. luck, mate. Good luck. Uh, Jakob Backer. Jacob Backer says, you could downsize and get two Blues or Pro Juniors wet dry. Yeah, I see now that's a great idea. It is a wonderful Two idea. Pro Juniors. Wet dry, oh man, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. I'm. It's a what? Yeah, it's really cool. Or tell you what, buy another Blues Deville, Blues Deluxe, <laughs> and do that wet dry. Done. Job done. Uh, Chris Quinn is saying, I'm not sure what the UK used market looks like, but in the US, uh, there's tons of amazing deals on secondhand amps. A thousand dollars gets you a huge, uh, really. Oh decent really? Amp. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. It's um. An interesting time for guitar amps at the moment. There's a lot coming up secondhand because so many people are switching to digital. So there are some bargains out there. Mm. Um, eh, dear gents. Oh, no, that was from G Barge. Uh, Bill Usaurus. Bill Usaurus. Hello, Bill. Uh, thank you for the years of entertainment. Much love from far away. Ah. He says... Billusaurus, thank you. Uh, I N R is the currency. Where's that then? Is it I N R currency? Would be oh, it's the Indian rupee. Oh, yeah. Apologies thank for you, my, mate. my ignorance. Uh, Tanelli Nordberg. Tanelli Nordberg. Hello, Tanelli. I'm thinking of building a wet dry rig with one side, maybe wet as the strymon iridium. And the other side as a Fender tube amp. Would this work? No. So yeah, the problem that you've got with the with the iridium is that you are digitizing that side of the signal and it's always going to be out of phase with the dry side. And it's proper out of phase because it's a time-based thing as opposed to a phase polarity thing. You've got that little bit of latency, and even though you know tiny bit of you know one millisecond of latency for the most part can be unperceivable when you put it in line with something that has no latency then you get a time-based phase difference and it just sounds weird um, the only thing that you can do is delay the dry side the same it's too complicated so I think <sighs> short answer it's very difficult to do it. If what you want is a wet dry rig that you've got on stage and sounding awesome, you need to have uh, no latency or the same amount of latency going to mm. both. Is the um, Iridium dual? Stereo in, I don't know. If, if the Iridium is dual, you could run your wet side through the Iridium and your dry side through the Iridium as well, and then you'll be equaling out the latency so it won't be too much of a... An issue, I believe that's what Chris Shiflet was doing. Although I did, he had, I have, two, he had two iridiums. Um, we didn't mic it directly, did we? But I remember really fighting with it sounding phasey, really phasey in my yeah, when I did the audio. Uh, and that was coming straight off the desk. 
So that could have been anything. That could have been anything. Ah, oh, apparently it does true stereo. Something has confirmed with customer support. So if you run it both through the Iridium, both sides through the Iridium and just make one wet and one dry. Uh, now, it might be that if you turn on extra cabinet simulation, that changes the latency. That changes the amount of latency, in which case you'll be out again. But Yeah, so it was held as unique because it can do independent stereo amp cab sim. Um, but yeah, so there you go. Yeah, so generally for like traditional TPS style wet dry, we would say don't use any no analog dry through digital devices because it does make it more difficult. Uh, and there are ways around it if you can, if you want, if, if the way around it is worth the tone. Yeah. And that's an interesting... ID74 says perhaps a simplifier, it's not digital. Yeah. I think, look, in all honesty, that's all great, but if you're talking about a wet-dry rig, you need, what's, the, what's the purpose of the Iridium? You need two cabs. Yeah. If you're talking about having a digital out going to one cab being, you know, that's my wet sound, then you still need a speaker and a source. For yeah. That. So, well, the other option would, would be that one's going straight to the house, but then you're not getting yeah it's, you're not getting the benefit. The, the the I mean, let's be honest about this. The biggest benefit of a wet dry rig is you is your experience of it. Yeah. Because by the time you commit it to the sound engineer, who knows? And you know, frankly, who cares? But, Indeed. <laughs> it's for you. The wet dry rig is for you. Yeah. So that you love the sound. Yeah. So one one thing we. Uh, it's very interesting with a wet dry wig is because you've got your sound on stage and you can mix it wet dry how you want and then all the sound guy has control over how much wet and how much dry so it's actually a really great solution for your on stage sound and the sound guy front of house so that's very cool and panda studio says hello dear lads been following for so long much love from manila philippines ah hello manila when i lived in singapore and we were playing at the europa clubs and there was a band that was playing with us. With, there's like three bands a night in every venue. And one of the bands was from the Philippines and they were the best cover band I had ever heard. Uh, I've still, to this day, never heard anything like it. And they would do, I think it was like, I think it was the law, you had to play Hotel California. Oh, right. Wow. And there were seven people in that band and it was like the record. It was it was eerie. Oh, really? Yeah, it was It was totally eerie. I was just having a little shiver moment thinking about how bad it could be. No, no. So I remember turning up there and we'd been, you know, the band I was in, we'd been playing for a while and we thought we were pretty good. And then we watched these guys in sound check and we, everyone's going, oops, yeah, are we, are we sure? <laughs> they were absolutely phenomenal. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, David Rosa says, I've been considering wet dry, but all this talk about the importance of dry through is me second guessing my setup. Does anyone know if the Empress Echo system has dry through? Yes. Yes, it does. Absolutely. Great dry through. Yeah. Yeah. You find, I mean, I'm going to offend somebody here quite seriously, but any of the really serious pedal companies, Empress, uh, Strymon for that matter, mm -hmm. for the most part, uh, Maris, Maris, uh, all the all the stuff that Dan and I tend to love and use will have analog dry through. Yeah. Um, and then people that are more sort of gauged towards the digital world, maybe not so much. Line six in most of the products. Like a good point. In fact, H ninety. Yeah, yeah. But Source Audio with their new delay come out and going, we've got analog dry through. Mm. You know, in, in their new version of the. Ventress. Uh, the yes. Yeah. It's and it's. Wonderful, because the reverb had analog dry through, and the collider has analog dry through, and for some reason the delay didn't have analog dry through, and as, like the, the, I think due to popular demand, like people, uh, they've come back and said they've done a new it. version, yeah, ADT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I remember having a tour on the show years and years ago. Yeah. And we we're talking about the analog dry through when he was. Uh, Tor to, Morganson, I think his name is, yeah. from who used to be with TC Electronic and is now with Universal Audio. Yeah. And he was like, well, you know, digital sounds great stuff, but I don't want my, my sound converted to ones and zeros. I just, mm. mentally, I don't want it. And I'm like, 
And I thought it was so cool coming from at that time they had outsold Boss and were the biggest pedal company in the world. Yeah. And it was like a really, it was just wonderful to hear that actually I just don't want, I want analog yeah. through. Because, oh. you know, and I was like, yeah, well done, mate. Well I done. don't know. I d I sit. We, Dan and I do sit in an ivory tower of sorts and we are very, very lucky to be hearing really amazing stuff played by really amazing people all the time. And it does rather raise the bar a little bit and you do get used to just hearing these epic sounds all the time and I will reiterate the difference in the analog front end of our recording system has been another level life changing yeah 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 another level and and that's not to say that music great music and great feeling and all the good stuff can't be had without all that of course it can of course it can but once you've heard it, it's very hard to go back. Yeah. It's very hard to go back. Yeah. 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 Um, Collider is perfect for the effects loop in my Marshall, says Mr. Wit 30 Totally agree. The The number of times we use the Collider on this show... I'm just gone. It's on my pedal board. If ever we've got, like, a gainy amp and we need something in the loop, it's always the Collider. It's yeah. such a flipping great pedal. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cody Newman says, what's analogue? through so Cody what that means is in a lot of these pedals that use like delay pedals or reverb pedals and things like that you've got your signal goes in and in a purely digital pedal when the signal goes in it then goes into an analog uh, converter um, and it converts the analog signal into digital and then it gets manipulated and then it goes back into a digital to analog converter and then out it goes. An analog drive through means that when the signal goes in, the signal is split. Part of it goes through an analog converter and then it does all the effects and things and then it goes back from a digital to analog converter and that gets mixed back on top of the analog drive through. And what that means is that the signal that goes into it is also present at the output with no latency, any effect is simply mixed on top of that signal. So when you're talking about delays and reverbs, you're talking about uh, just the effect, like the echo or the sound of the space. When you get that mix that says, the, the knob that says mix or blend, you are blending that wet effect sound on top of the signal that came into it. And that is the analog dry through. It means there's no latency when I've got two amplifiers and I've got an analog dry through pedal on one side and I hit a note. That note is present at both amps at the same time and both amps are perfectly in phase. If I've got one side that doesn't have an analog dry through, that little bit of latency means that that note is going to hit the amplifiers at slightly different times. And that's going to cause a phase shift. Yeah. And it, and then weird things start happening right through the frequency range. This isn't new, and it's not necessarily about guitar. It's how records are made yeah. as well. So if you've got your vocal, for example, you would then send off from a, from a separate send somewhere on the desk into your reverb, for example, whatever that reverb might be. And you would only be hearing the wet sound from the reverb. You wouldn't be hearing the dry sound as well. You'd be hearing the wet sound only. That would get mixed back in on top of the original dry sound. Not always how it works with modern plugins, but certainly how it works in, you know, serious studios and all the, most of the records you love. Uh, and it's just applying that parallel wet effects mixing to guitar tones. Yep. It's not new. And when you hear it, we do it every experience day and the response is the same, like jaw drops of like, oh my God. I you never, just see the light bulbs come on. Never quite realised it was going to be like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really, it's magic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, we're, now we're flipping preaching down. <laughs> With apologies. But I, no, no apologies. I, it's like, this is important stuff. This is next level. You know, this isn't, this isn't, um, this is an overdrive pedal and turn the gain up and you get more distortion. This is sort of the next level and it's important 
because we're all uh, on this voyage, right? And we're all trying things out. And, we're, and, and, and when you get to a two amp thing, it's such an amazing thing. When you hear, the first time you hear two amps turned on together and you like, well, I've got everything I love about that app and everything I love about that app and it all just combines and it sounds massive and it is, a, a, it's amazing. Yeah. It's a revelation. And then when you start doing things like, oh, now I'm going to put that pedal into that app. Well, hang on, everything's changed. Why yeah. is that? So yeah. this level of understanding is, if you, you know, when you're exploring this stuff, if you can understand this stuff, it will make the world a difference. Yes, and for all of those who attempted to j j jive in with, well, Jimi Hendrix didn't do it. And it's like, no, he probably didn't live, but by the time his records were made, it was being done. Yeah, by uh, some combination of Eddie Kramer and Roger Mayer and some other people. So that's how the effects were added. Yeah, the reverbs and stuff, especially. Uh, jolly good. Um, jolly good. Eagle Ray Rob. <laughs> oh, Rob. He says, uh, a box of assorted TPS merch was delivered today. Ah. Thank you, Rob. Thank, thank you, you, buddy. He says, I look forward to opening it when I get home. Thanks for sharing your time and talents. Big love to all the TPS crew and the entire TPS tribe. Because stamp out rubbish tone. Absolutely. Yes. Greg Johnson. Volume is not the problem. Crap tone is the problem. <laughs> Honestly. And we can tell you're serious, Greg, because you have two Gs. I got, I got a friend called Gary, drummer, who's two R's. He's... He's a harder hit in Gary than Gary's with one Gary. eye. Gary. Yeah, yeah. And I think Greg Gary. with two Gs. I think you're a serious Greg. Uh, there's what, a nice... Two, but there's always two Gs in Greg. No. And then there's three Gs. Oh, I see. Two Gs at the end. Oh, okay. Yeah, three right, Gs. Three Gs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and of course, in 2024, it'll be 5G, Greg. Uh, <laughs> what are your benefits? What are the benefits? Uh... Or drawbacks, says Greg Johnson. What are the benefits or drawbacks of running a low gain overdrive at its highest setting versus a high gain overdrive at a low gain setting? Which makes more sense to do? Okay. So, perfectly reasonable question. Let's take a high gain overdrive and a low gain overdrive. Oh, I don't know. What's a low gain overdrive? Okay. They're all high gain when you turn them up. Um, uh, where is it? Light speed. Yeah. Just got plenty Still of gain. Plenty of gain of that. Yeah, yeah I'll give it here. Right. Give it here. Give it here. Okay. Let's give just here. call that low gain for the time. So what being. Greg is saying is, do we have the drive up high like that? I'm oh, sorry, the drive down low like that and the level up high on a high gain device. Dan, tell the people that I'm saying this is a high gain device with the level high and the drive low. This is a high gain device with the level high and the drive low. This is a lower gain device with the gain high and the volume set whatever else. That's a lower gain device with the gain high and the volume set low. Yeah, or, or wherever. Wherever. Wherever on the volume, just whatever works to your amp. Yeah, that's a good question. So, it is completely circuit dependent. Uh, some pedals simply have a massive uh, gain range and you know, sound great all the way through. If you have a pedal that's been specifically designed for lower gain, and then it's voiced for lower gain, and so you'll have a, you know, like a, a crunchy setting, and then it'll get to a point where it sounds a bit, you know, like, like a limiting amp thing, but never goes into full on distortion. If you've got like a full on hard clipping distortion, when you turn that down, again depending on the circuit but it can just be add a little bit of grit it all de like it can be a bit like driving your car around in first gear though can't it, it it can be it's like it's not it's not very happy here because what we talk about sweet spots in pedals a lot and depending on the way you play and the, what it's played into you'll find you know every ant has a couple of sweet spots well, every pedal will have a, at least a couple of sweet spots and you know when you have a we are spoiled for amazing designers and, and, and things. And you'll find that spot where the pedal just sounds, it's open and it's doing its thing and it'll be where the designer, where it's been voiced to sound great. Now, 
I'd like for me a really good low gain overdrive. That sweet spot will be it's just breaking up nicely when you dig in. It's it's got the dynamic to it. Um. But yeah, a lot of low gain devices when you turn them up, like the Blues Driver, the Keeley, or, or you know the Boss Blues Driver. People think it's a low gain thing. Man, there is so much gain in that thing. It's incredible. I don't think it sounds particularly great when it's gained up like that, unless you're Andy Timmons and you've got treble bleed here and you turn mm. the guitar down and that's your clean tone. And it's, it sounds amazing. Yeah. It's all, it's all, yeah. So, so the answer is there aren't really any significant benefits or, uh, or downsides. It's really, really pedal dependent on how you like to push it. One thing Dan and I do like is making sure the volume's pretty high on an overdrive pedal, or at least is up there. Because it does seem to be, a bit in the way that all potentiometers work, there's like an optimum, there seems to be an optimum place where it sounds right. Like, oh, Deluxe Reverb is totally mad. It sounds rubbish, 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 rubbish. And then literally, within about 0 0.2 of the volume knob, it goes, oh, I'm awake. Yeah. Now that could well be something to do with what's happening inside the amp, but it's gonna be the same in the pedal. And it's really, I don't know, I've got pedals that just don't sound, that just sound so much better when the knobs are in their most open position. That sounds yeah. like the maddest thing to say. I was just looking for the an SD9 to, sh to show, oh, there it is, okay. How did I not see that there? Because it's, it's green, okay. SD9 is a really good example, certainly for me, that with the distortion turned down quite a lot and the level turned up like nearly all the way and the tone nearly all the way off, you know, it, you put the tone up so it just basically tone circuit kicks in and it sounds wonderful. But there's not many pedals that you could set like that. No, no, no. It's, un it's unusual for, it's to, for extreme settings to be the optimum, exactly. optimum spot. It, exactly. There is a huge amount of misunderstanding on flipping analog dry through out there, Dan. Right. Um, don't. I'm gonna, one last thing on analog dry through, right? Don't confuse polarity, which is the signal being up and down flipped with a time delay. Yeah. So if you flip the polarity, that com that corrects a completely out of phase circuit. So if your speakers are doing that, and you cre correct the polarity, they're then doing that, right? The problem with non-analog dry through is they're doing that. Or actually, they're doing this. They're going, yeah, like that. Oh yeah, so they are. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not a one eighty polarity flip. It's delayed. Yeah, it's it's a delay. Yeah, and it's not a delay that you can fix because if you flip it the other way, it just flips it and it's still delayed. Yeah. So that's so. I think if we get the terminology right. DD3 is analog drive through, by the way, for all those of you who are asking. Yes. If you think of polarity, is the same. If you take your wires from your speaker and you turn them the other way around so that the positive becomes the negative, and so this push on that becomes a pull, that is polarity. When we flip that, we flip it 180 degrees, we're flipping the polarity. If we have a time delay, we're, we're, in, we're introducing a timed phase shift. And that's things like phases, right? That's what that's doing. The difference between uh, when you introduce a capacitor and, and a resistor, when you change the resistance alongside the capacitor, you get this phase shift in frequency, and, uh, which again, it's a, it's a time delay. Um, flanges is a really good example because flanges were talking about a tiny uh, delay time. And so you do get that, you do get that phasing thing where you get a, it's like a comb filter. Yeah. And you'll hear, when you, when you get these 
when you get these shifts in phase between one speaker and the other one, you hear that comb filter effect. And it's like, oh, okay, there's something. It's you hear it immediately, and it sounds weird. Yeah. Uh, well, when you when you start to recognise what what it is, it's like, yeah, there's one of those is, is has shifted in time. There might be some argument that says once you get in a big reverberant room with loads of, the effect is less pronounced than in a straight, ambient you know non ambient room like we're in now. You can hear it so clearly in here. And it might be that once you get out into a bigger room, you've got all sorts of reflections happening. It's not such a big deal, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go with that. I would, I would want it right to begin with, mm. no matter what the environment. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Because yeah. it affects how all your harmonics develop and how the guitar interacts with the speakers and your amps and all that. It's fundamentally important to how the thing resonates, mm -hmm. lest that, lest we forget that. Indeed. Anyway, God, sorry, we could talk about it for weeks, and it sounds like we might need to. Um, Eric Zenhausen. Hello, Eric. He Good says, uh, after playing guitar for close to 50 years, I can no longer claim to be a beginner. <laughs> We're all beginners. Uh, but being self-taught, I have serious knowledge gaps. Any suggestions for video courses for someone in my situation? True Fire. True Fire. So good. Their Check out a website so called True Fire. Yeah. And their courses are fantastic, ranging from very, very beginner level, which... If you're like me, you need to do beginner courses because I have, well, I wouldn't say zero. I have very little theory knowledge. So I have to do the, the entry level stuff. And then you can, you can whiz through that relatively quickly if you pick it up and then work up. I wouldn't say start in the middle and work back because it might be that it's, that it's over your head in terms of the knowledge. Because, you know, so many of us out there, out there can play quite a lot of stuff, but actually don't know what we're playing which is sounds like you. And if you want to fill those gaps, start at the beginning, however yeah. boring that might seem. It, so that example that Mick gave, you know, we all know that Mick is an amazing guitar player. But and the idea, I think some of you might find of Mick going back and do a more rudimentary course on that stuff. It's not about, that's not about the guitar playing as such. That's about just covering a, 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 a knowledge gap that it's like, okay, I, I want to find out what's going on in the chord between the one chord and the four chord. What's the difference? Because it'll be stuff that you're already doing, but you'll be able to put a name to it. And it becomes like this really, I, I know we're going to see, use the example of a jigsaw puzzle. Um, I'm not sure that's the right analogy, but yeah, a but dot to dot drawing where you go, oh. oh. Yeah. That's what, that's that sound I recognize and that makes complete sense. Now I've got a name for it. Exactly. Yeah. And so I would, if you've been playing for a long time, there's a really good chance that you'll be able to play a lot of that stuff. But if, if you have knowledge gaps, I cannot stress enough the benefit of going back and filling those gaps and the enjoyment um because i i love uh when i hear something most of the time when i hear something that blows my mind i'll analyze it and when i say most of the time there are some songs that i'll never analyze because they're just so magical to me i don't want to remove that but when i hear a sound and i'm like well what is going on there and i want to work out what the changes are and you know and that stuff and when you fill those gaps, what it does is it just gives you more places to go. And I think the blues is a really good example. I think like everyone that I knew when I started doing the blues was doing this, right? Let's rock and roll. Well, that's what, but yeah. Okay. So uh, Australian blues. Yeah. Okay. Right. Oh, right. But then when I started getting into jazz, and it was all, I know, thinking, okay. And then working out what was going on with the chords in that. So that when I started playing, you know, that one, four, five pattern, it was just all over the pentatonic thing. 
But then when I realized, actually there are other chords going on there, when I get to that four chord, back to the one, five, four, one, five. And, and it's like, okay, th as your, as your knowledge base grows with that stuff and, and you, especially when you listen to, to artists and then it's like, oh, I know what that sound is. Uh, it, yeah, it's, it's really cool. But if you, what, I guess what I'm saying is if you're playing a long time, you may know how to play this stuff. But if you, if you don't understand it, it's really worthwhile going back and filling those gaps. And, and True Fire, they have wonderful courses to do that. Great tutors. Great. The really Andy Timmer's course is amazing. Um, the uh, what's the guy who plays the the uh, Esquire? Alan Hines. Alan Hines' course is brilliant. Yeah, I I've done the Alan Hines course and I I wouldn't recommend it because it, it's a lot of ethereal stuff. Oh, okay. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. There's a lot of. It's basically just like, hey man, if you like, can. Zen yourself into awesome guitar playing. You'll be awesome guitar playing. <laughs> There's a little bit more to it than that, but I, I think maybe that's one for later when you want to start thinking a bit more. Right. The Robin Chord. Oh, Robin, Robin Chord. Ford. Robin Ford. I think it's called Chord Mastery or something. Yeah. And he starts right at the beginning of learning your major triads and stuff like that. And that is so foundational for understanding everything that comes after. I would recommend that wholeheartedly. Yeah. Uh, I think it's called chord revolution maybe the robin ford one i'll tell you um also check out jeff mccurlane he's just got so many great courses on true fire definitely worth checking out uh, but they've got some fantastic instructors on there and there if you sign up for the all you can eat deal um you flipping god man this is like hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of guitar lessons on there so um and even i don't know what i paid for the robin ford one like 30 bucks or 50 bucks or something yeah certainly a lifetime's worth of work if you want it you know so there's there's a bunch of of um courses that robin's done jazz revolution songcraft there's one called chord revolution um chord evolution is in there yeah it could be that one. and then solo revolution riff revolution blues motif revolution yeah chord revolution yeah yeah chord, chord revolution, revolution is the one i've done and it's very very start at the beginning and I, st I haven't finished it, obviously, because you do the first four lessons and then you give up. But um, it's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Michael Giliberto. Good luck, Eric. Yeah, good, good luck, luck, mate. Michael Giliberto. Hi, Michael. He says, uh, greetings, DNM and TPSs. When you did the high pedal volume clean amp show, both amps were non-master volume. I'm trying it with a master volume amp, keeping the input volume low for headroom. Mm -hmm. It seems to work. What are your thoughts? Yeah. yeah. By having the master volume up loud, you are opening up the potential for the power amp so that the more signal coming through the preamp, the power amps, they're sort of ready to go. Yes. Now, it, it has been said before, that to turn your non-master volume amp into a master volume amp, other way around, to turn your master volume amp into a non-master volume amp, turn the master volume up to 10 and use the gain control, that is not true on most amps. Because actually what happens in a Marshall is you're turning them both up at the same time. Yeah. So the danger of doing the ultimate extension of what you're doing, i.e. having the master flat out and no front end, is that it can end up sounding a bit sterile because the front end isn't working. So you want to get a sweet spot of both, really. Yeah. Generally, higher master, lower front end. Absolutely. But don't take that to the extreme where you're just not pushing that front end at all because a lot of the harmonics and interest in the amp come from making sure the front end is working a little bit. Fair? Very fair. Yeah. Mike2203, hello Mike. Nice to hear from you, buddy. Mike came to an experience day. He says, hi DM. I felt dismayed at the Mark Knopfler Christie's auction prices. Been a few comments on this actually tonight. I wonder if any buyers are guitarists. That's um, question one. Uh, any tips on fixing a loose telly knob, please? 
Uh, telly switch knob. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I can help with the telly switch do knob. that first. Jeff McCurlane's in the chat. Hello, Jeff. Hello, Jeff. Hope you're doing great, matey. Um, yeah, so a couple of things for your telly switch. I lost Red's original telly switch. I think it was the first gig and it went flying, gone forever. So, I shall show you this. This uh, this switch has been on there been on here for a long time, and it's a bit loose. But one thing that does work is this. I'm going to take the switch off and show you what's underneath. Give us a clue. Is what? it? Have you have you so, roughed it up? If you twisted it no I, what i did was i grabbed a pair of snips oh and and i pinched went, down the end and i pinched it in the middle yeah and it it broadens out yeah. a little section so it grips oh there you go onto that so just explain that where do you put the snips so i'll grab i'll grab some scissors so you can or do we have snips here right we we'll grab some scissors yeah. Show and, show and tell. Remember, people, be careful with sharp objects, especially around people you want to kill. <laughs> so let's pretend these are snips. I'm getting out of the way. Right. <laughs> what I'm doing is I am. I'm going in here. This way. And hopefully you can see that there's a little indent on that. Now, you need to be very careful because actually the metal on the switch is very soft. It's really easy with a pair of snips to go and snip the whole end off. Oh, is it? Yeah. So mm -hmm. you don't want to snip your go, end off. Go, <laughs> go gentle. On the end. <laughs> What's his name? John Wayne Bobbitt. Was that his name? <laughs> Here we are laughing at the severance of the penis. And then that your little tip. Oh, stick on that and then it'll give us something to grip onto. Other I know people have um, recommended glues and things, and that's all good. But with this method you can still, you know, if you want to change you know whatever you can still take the tip off um, but it just you know yeah. it makes it more secure ben allmark is saying he takes it off and puts a small piece of tape around the metal snug it back on like you could use a small piece of masking tape or something yeah that, that can work anything like that yeah yeah um yeah blue painters tape says scott gayler yeah drop of hot milk glue says scott from baltimore isn't there a song about Baltimore? On the streets of Baltimore. Grand Parsons, was it? Um, rubber cement, says Wes Chilton. A dot with a centre pu punch will broaden a bit of metal. Oh, OK. A tiny hammer, an anvil wanted, he says. <laughs> I can't think of anvils without thinking of the Roadrunner. And it dropping on Wiley Coyote's neck or something. <laughs> It's the only... No one used no, anvils. No, like I don't think I've ever seen an anvil <laughs> apart from that. We, we had, we had like, <laughs> pretend anvils in metal shop when I was a kid, but I've never, apart from that. Uh, Robert Iboy says, uh, apparently Monty's has got a video explaining all about this. Okay. Actually, a bit of a... Uh, have you noticed I'm back on the contacts? Oh, are you? I discovered something about contact lenses. For those of you who but a, are but a super glue on the contacts that don't come out. Obsessed with me putting my glasses on and off and blah, blah. I've just realised because I'm thinking, hang on, I haven't got my glasses on. I went to reach for my glasses and I've remembered I've got my contact lenses in. I discovered something about contact lenses. Do tell. <laughs> it really makes a difference if you put them in the right eyes. <laughs> when I got my contact lenses, I read the prescriptions and they are exactly the same. I right. thought, how is that possible for like 
Anyway, when I looked again, they're not exactly the same. So all those weeks I've been moaning about my contact lenses, I've been put. I had two left eyes in. No way. Yeah. Oh, that's hilarious. I mean, they're still crap for mid distance, but for this, they they really work. So anyway, oh. sorry, talking about me again. Uh, Malcolm um, Burgess says, "Hey Dan, how's the BJJ going? Great, thanks, mate. Train this morning. Um, yeah, I'm. It's part of my." If I don't train for a week, I've realized I suffer. Um, there's a, you know, mental health and just general feeling of well-being. But if I'm, you know, just if I, if I can train at least three or four times a week, it just, man, it's great. And it's the same for any physical fitness, right? It's such an important thing yeah. of just living your best life. So certainly for me, I find it great. But yeah, thank you very much, mate. It's going very well. Um, and back to Mike's original point, he felt dismayed about the Mark Knopfler auction oh, prices. Oh, okay, yeah, right. And a lot of people are saying that as well. I, I mean, you can't be dismayed about it, can you? They, they have collectible value, they have historical value, and like any antique or collectible item, they're going to command silly money. Um, it was also partly for charity, so it might have been that the buyers wanted to do some sort yeah. of a small amount of pay it forward. I mean, if they really wanted to pay it forward, they just pay it forward and... Wouldn't buy a guitar at an auction, but um, yeah, I, I don't know. It is what it is, isn't it? Yeah. These things have a value because it's just straight Adam Smith economics, unfortunately. Supply and demand. And if you draw the draw the curve, when the supply is low, the price is high. Um, and that's it. Indeed. Yeah. Never forget that there are... Never forget where you come from. We, you know, Mick and I have just recently acquired a couple of beautiful old guitars. This is my latest acquisition. This is a 62 SG Les Paul. And, you know, it's had some work done. So it wasn't, you know, it's a player's instrument but it's a very lovely thing. And, you know, these are expensive, but when you look at, like, the absolutely outrageous money that um, that some of these things cost, it's like, oh, yeah, there's... When you get into that world, there's a lot of... There's so much money people have to buy that stuff. You know, there's a lot of money out there. So much. Catherine went to Marlborough on Saturday. I love Marlborough. To meet a friend. She said she's literally never seen so many new Land Rover Defenders yeah. and Range Rovers. And that's not even real money, is it? No. You go to certain parts of the world, <laughs> in the Middle East, for example, <laughs> that's where the real money is, and other parts of the world. Mm. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's just. Again, draw the graph. It's not that hard. There's, there's all the wealth in the world, and 0.0000001% owned 80% of it. So uh, that's how that works. So yeah, they can afford to buy the guitars, and we shouldn't begrudge it, really. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just, it's economics, isn't it? It's just economics. Um, Do you think most of them are banking on the value of those guitars going up, or they just want a bit of, you know, they boyhood heroes and childhood heroes I, I, I think if you surely if you've got a lot of cash and you're looking at it from in, a straight investment point of view then there are other things that you could spend your money on property I don't know I've never had any money so I literally have no idea um, I don't if you had that much cash to blow on a guitar if you had half a million dollars to blow on a guitar and you were buying it purely for investment I would buy a house for half a million dollars. So Stephen Parker pounds. said the Schecht Telly went for nearly five hundred thousand pounds. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's there's no sense in that at all. No. So maybe it's a huge fan, or maybe it's someone more money than sense. I don't. I, I mean, the the thought of being able to sell that Schecht Telly again for more than that in the future, outside of a Christie's auction that Mark Knopfler is not at, seems unlikely to yeah. me. Yeah. Now the burst, maybe. Aha, yes, okay. I believe there was a burst in there, wasn't there? Yes, there was a burst. 
Yeah, I, well, whatever. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, Chris W. Oh, no, Andy Bell. Hi, Andy. Hi, Andy. Andy came to see us for an experience day, and it was his birthday. Oh, yeah. He says, uh, no cue, just a big thanks to Catherine for being a legend. Uh, Post-experience day, I now have my 5150 pre-wet stuff. JCM 2000 effects loop as a moist, dry setup, and it doesn't suck. Well done, mate. Good on you, Andy. That's awesome. Chris W, he says, hi, DNM. How do you get back into playing after an extended break? My fingers just don't behave as they should. Also, I just received a QMX8. What a difference. Thanks to Dan and the Gig Rig crew. Oh, thank you, buddy. So you haven't played for a while. How do you get back into it, says Chris W. The way in is music. Um, someone, I saw a question posted recently where someone had said, they've got all these amazing guitars and amplifier and no desire to play guitar. And it's so interesting because I've, I've been through periods where I focused so much on the playing that music was sort of secondary. And then I'd, you know, I'd be in the car and the song would come on and it would spark something. And I'd go off on a, on a little journey of discovery with, with music. And then it was like, I was straight back in to wanting to play guitar. So for me, certainly, um, being in a place where you can enjoy music, uh, being in a place where you're not stressed as well, because the first thing that goes for me, creativity, it, it, creativity is when I'm stressed. Um, so being able to, de you know, deal with that stuff in your life. Um, but it's okay every now and then to put the guitar down and just go back and listen to some albums. Go back and listen to, if you can remember, what was the first artist that you heard that you thought guitar is really cool? Go back and revisit some of that stuff. Have a listen to some, one of the things I like about um, like Apple Music and that stuff is if I put on a song that I like, it starts recommending stuff yeah. afterwards. And I've discovered so much music yeah, through yeah, that. Yeah, me too, me too. Um, so, yeah, ha ha yeah, go and have a listen. Have, go back and have a listen to some of that stuff that got you lit up. And, yeah. Don't, don't be too hard on yourself as well for not... Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the, the really... The crux of it is to not be too hard on yourself. And the, the source of being hard on yourself is comparing yourself to others. Yeah. And of course, it's natural, isn't it? I, I had to have a serious word with myself this weekend. I'm looking at Instagram, seeing old flipping floppy fingers and little hands and all those amazing guitar players. Like, And I'm just thinking, what am I doing? Yeah. Why am I even bothering with this damn thing? And you, you get into a couple of minutes of just watching all these preposterously talented guitar players and going well if i live for 500 years and practice three hours a day i'm never going to get there and then you start you know being dumb about it and but of course the problem of that is you're you're comparing yourself to others and, and wanting to be like them which is is a no-win strategy it's a cause of major suffering so what do you do you don't focus on the result so you're saying you know your fingers aren't really working like you want them to okay don't think about they're not working like they were five years ago or i want to be able to play cliffs of dover that's not what you're working on what you're working on is the process you need a system and the system might say play 20 minutes a day whatever it is play a g major scale play a song you like play the g major scale again stop whatever the system is come up with a system hmm. and make the system your only focus yeah absolutely your only focus so the minute you start saying things like oh i'm never going to get there or my playing sucks or my fingers don't work you've come out of the system and if you do the system consistently and you stick to it and you make it you make a point of doing it what you'll find is before you even know it your fingers will be working again yeah and yet the progress you make will be hey, baby, massive 
So I would say do that. Don't focus on the result. Focus on the system. And just day by day, bit by bit, do it. Rosie. Honestly, it'll work. It will work. Yeah. Hello, Rose. What are you up to then? You coming up here? Or are you going to stay down there? You're a bit tired. You say hello to the people. Come on, come up here. Come on. You going to come up here? No? Okay, fine. Uh, Rosie's here, by the way. I would pick her up, but she doesn't really like being picked up, do you? Not a massive fan of being picked up. Have I got a treat in my pocket? Probably not. There we go. <laughs> I just totally tricked the dog into jumping up. Um, and I'll pay for that, won't I, Rosie? Go on and say hello to the people. That's all right, sit down. Come on, you can sit down. You can do it. That's Good what, girl. She's like, she wants to sit on Uncle Dan. Good girl. Do you, Rosie? Yes. Should we say hello to the people? Look, look over there. She's like, no, I want Dan. Okay. <laughs> no, she doesn't. She wants Mummy. So I have, to go home, Rose. I have a, a, a routine in the mornings where once I get back from training, yeah, the house is still quiet. I have a cup of coffee and I'll just sit down with my guitar. And most days I only get like half an hour before I've got to, you know, the day begins in earnest. Um, but I, I cherish that moment. I look forward to it so much. And I've gotten so much out of those out of these mornings and some mornings honestly it's I play very little some mornings it's just having the guitar in my hands and just strumming a few things and having it you know and I'll put on the the was it air headphones and go through some songs and just play along mm. oh, man I, it's so much fun you're but, really good at doing it well it's just become that thing is now you've got a system I've got a system yeah and I I love it and I can't it's like if I uh it sets me up for the day. It might be the coffee that sets me up for the day, but uh, having the, you know, yeah. So I, f I find that really fun. Yeah. And I, also, sorry, if you're, if the other thing is, um, if you've got a couple of mates that play something, get some people over and, and play. Go to a jam. Um, I, it's so funny. So my, my brother, who I'm seeing... Uh, week after next it's coming over here for like one day and he got me into guitar when I was very young and then he's he's went away from music for a long time and recently last few years he's gotten back into it and I had a rehearsal with him and his band when I was out in Australia and it was so much fun but we've reconnected over guitar and it's been the most amazing thing my um, I've got really really close friends who was in my first ever band with you share something, when you share music and play music with someone, you share something that's, it's the closest thing to real magic in the world. It's truly amazing. So if you do have an opportunity to play with other people in whatever, yeah, whatever context that whatever is, context. Yep. do it. Yep. I, you will never do that and regret it. Yeah. And I, certainly speaking personally, the less I do it, the less I want to play. Yeah. And it becomes this sort of downward spiral. So I'm in it. I'm in it at the moment. I don't. Right. The first I played guitar today because we made a couple of videos, and that's the first time I played guitar since we filmed last. Right. Which is over two weeks ago. Okay. And I don't. You know, I. I need a system. So maybe we could do it together. Just agree on one thing you're going to do every day, and do it, and make sure you do it. And I've done it with walking the dog, and yeah. I've done it with exercising. So yeah. I started running back in. Um, I don't know, end of the summer last year and I couldn't run very far at all. So I just made sure I did it relatively regularly. Now I run three times a week and I can run 5K, no worries. That's amazing. Uphills like that. That's amazing. No worries. Uh, Slight worry. I can do 3K up and down hills, no worries. 5K, I'm a bit knackered when I get home. But, you know, that, that hasn't been going, I want to run 5K because I don't want to run 5K. I don't want to run 10K. That is just about going, I'm going to do it two, three times a week and I'm going to do it whatever happens, however slow. And that that is the focus. Yeah. Ryan Cuthrill says, I'm going to jam with some new guys tomorrow. Really excited. That's brilliant, mate. Well done. Yeah, I would encourage all of you if, you, if you have an opportunity to go and play with other people, it's a it's such a wonderful, yeah, yeah. meaningful experience. And it's a reset, isn't it? Totally. Yeah. 
But stop. We've all got. We've all have to agree among ourselves to stop comparing ourselves to yeah. other people. It is. It is just suffering. And that you know, watching Book of Ack and feeling awful is not really the intention. No. No, not at all. <laughs> I still do it. Sorry. Uh, good. Um, David Wall says. Open mic nights are brilliant, energising and learning experiences. I do two or three a week. That's fantastic, oh, wow. David. Good for you, man. That's fantastic. Good for you, because they can also be scary and uh, unwelcoming, some of them. But Can I just say, that there was a... Um, back in Australia, I did this gig, this jazz thing, and then at the end of it was like a little open mic session. And this guy got up and he said, I've only been playing guitar for a couple of months and it's the most amazing thing and I've written this song. And he was, he had some sort of professional job, like he was a lawyer or something. And he sang this song and there was like, you know, two chords. And everyone in the audience was so moved because he just poured his heart out and you could see how much it, it meant to him. And I just thought that there is getting to that point where you can say something. It's what we're all trying to do, you know, and we go through other ways to do it. But just being able to play and, and be with people and it's so special. It is. It's, it's well, it's why we do it, isn't it? It's why, yeah. we, it's why we turned up here today and did this. Yeah. Because that's the result. Lucas wants to know... If you've got an idea for a compressed, gritty, grainy overdrive for Dirty Blues. I've got exactly the thing for you, Lucas. And it is this. Oh, yeah. The Walrus 385 overdrive. Amazing. There you go. Just amazing. Based on the old, is it Bell & Howarth? I forget the actual the, name. The projector amplifier. Projector amplifier, mm. yeah. Um, Favoured of Blake Mills and other people like that. Yeah, that's a killer. Uh, so yeah, there you go. Just get that. Um, right, we do need to hurry up a little bit, Daniel, because okay. we're over time and we've got some to go. Sorry okay. for being over by everybody. Uh, Adam Dobbs. Hi, Adam. Hi, Adam. He says, uh, I run two amps, a deluxe reverb reissue that gets a Royal Blue Overdrive, Mad Professor. Beautiful. A Duelist, a Boost, and a Reason Rich Robinson 50, which is mm. like a, a JTM type amp. It gets a Rattler and a Tumnus. I want to add a Dr. Z Remedy cranked and go three ways, but fuzz to the only to the first two. What are your thoughts? <laughs> you live in a very, very rarefied air, Adam, to be able to run three amps like that. What a lovely, lovely thing. Uh, okay. So there's a lot of splitting going on there. So if the f if the fuzz is only going to the first two, or you're saying you want the fuzz to go into the, all the other stuff as well, but then just read out the signal path through one more time. Um, so we've got uh, a deluxe reverb, yep. Royal Blue OD, yep. a Duelist, a Boost. So just overdrives yeah two overdrives and a boost and then the other one is a rich robinson 50 yep. watt which has got a rattler and a tumnus yep uh and then he wants to add a dr z remedy uh but fuzz to only the first two amps so dr z remedy is another amp another amp cranked and run fuzz into the first the other two amps and only fuzz that's what I'm not getting. Is it only fuzz into those two amplifiers or? Well, let's take both options. So if you're going to add fuzz to those other overdrive pedals, really cool. If you're saying you want to keep the effects chain as is, but run fuzz to only to the other amps, it's just going to be a matter of matching gain and volume levels. Yeah. Because what you're going to have there is an absolutely massive gamma of, of volume and gain. Yeah. And possible... Potential. Yeah, possible phase polarity issues yeah. as well. But Number one, make sure your that. phase is all sorted out. It's yeah. all sorted out. So you will be splitting the signal at least twice. Um, if it is splitting the signal at the front, 
and then going into the fuzz and then splitting out of that fuzz into two amplifiers and then from the because what I'm not sure if this is what you're trying to do but if you want the fuzz to go only into those first two amplifiers then what you'll need to do is you need to split the guitar signal one side goes into the fuzz that goes out is split into those two amplifiers and then from the other guitar signal that goes into the other pedals and that goes into the center amplifier it's like a fuzz drive fuzz thing could sound really awesome you one thing that is absolutely essential is you need to make sure you've got a single path to earth and that the other things uh, the other two amplifiers have isolated outputs um really important now you haven't mentioned any wet things um, and if you want to be able to send the other gain stages into the other amplifiers as well it could be as simple as a bunch of splitters and summers with isolation devices at the end of the chain um, but it depends how complex you want it to get so yeah my my advice would be um, if you've got like some stereo boss pedals or something lay around that are splitting the signal even when the signal is off so it's like a pass like a buffer that splits the signal um, the easiest thing to do is draw out the signal path yeah make sure that you it's just think of it like water and like a you know how that is going into you know eventually you've got to get three streams to the amplifiers and you're going to put your pedals in with those streams um, but you you just need to split it and then wherever you need to sum it so join the streams and then split the streams again um, but yeah there's not enough information just from that message to tell me exactly how you want to run those things but it might be as simple as splitting the signal straight away one side goes into the fuzz and that goes splits out of that into two amplifiers the other side of the split goes in the other drives and that goes into the center amplifier i hope that made sense i need a what i need is a is a whiteboard and we can draw things out like rishi sunak's party political broadcast whiteboard oh really do you see that no politics aside the man's handwriting is a travesty oh really yeah i mean i kind of like that i really like the um the the concept was excellent right uh it, really excellent because he did explain some stuff quite nicely i'm not, not coming down on either side but uh the, the handwriting man just uh, indecipherable it was like a gp but flip chart always popular yeah 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 uh jeff martin Jeff says, I want a vibe reverb, but I don't have 8K. That's funny. You and me both were on reverb today looking at vibe reverbs then. Are they that expensive? Yeah. Uh, I'm what is it about the vibe reverb? Because I know there's a Stevie Ray um, connection there, isn't there? Yeah, 210 or 1 by 15 generally. Um, oh, really? Vibe reverb was 26L6s, I think. I think. Uh, just one of those, if you're as confused about fender amps as i am of that period there's just so many different ones right but they vary in speaker size whether okay. they've got reverb and tremolo whether they've just got reverb actually anyway Patience, my pet. um the reverb circuit blah 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 what speaker it had whether it had a tube rectifier or not whether it was two tubes or four whether mm. they were six v6s or six l6s etc 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 blah 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 but i think the reason the vibe reverb is so popular is because stevie ray okay famously Use them right anyway blah 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 uh he says um i'm thinking of modding a silver panel bandmaster reverb to the spec and adding a 15 inch speaker do you have any more economical suggestions um i didn't know about the bandmaster reverb so while dan was just talking about signal paths i had a look at the bandmaster reverb really interesting so we know about the old bandmaster right three by ten mm amp that Pete Townsend used with the Gretsch on Won't Get Fooled Again and some other things that Joe Walsh gave him, I believe. Um, and I think we had a Bandmaster in here once. 
very very early breakup overdrives like yeah. a good and yeah, yeah. beautiful thing uh, and of course that went which i didn't know the next bit it goes through to the sort of silver panel era of fenders in the 70s and there's a 40 watt one with reverb and uh, with reverb in a massive head like a flipping jewel showman head wow looks really cool yeah i mean dan and i don't know enough about those circuits to know how moddable it is but if it's a similar circuit path and you've got the same kind of transformer, that's going to be quite important, I would have thought. Mm -hmm. um, then, yeah, it's all possible. Or you could get, or you could go to someone like Headstrong, depending where you are in the world, or Rift Amps in the UK to have him build you one from scratch. There is something magic about vintage amps, no yeah. doubt about it. Yeah, yeah. Old transformers. Just, I don't know. I don't know. Um, the reissues are pretty good. AC's got a reissue. He likes it. A great deal. In fact, there are days when he preferred his reissue to the, his original 64. <laughs> right. I can't... Why didn't I buy that amp? He sold it for really sensible money, I think. Anyway. Um, so, yeah, I I just don't know, Jeff. Sorry to, to be vague about it. But perhaps a first step could be talking to somebody like Headstrong or Rift in the UK or any of those other custom builders that really know these things inside out and could could recommend some mods yeah yeah the, i know that it's a common thing a lot of the silver panel fenders depending on how late into the 70s you go and again this is a massive generalization but the further into the 70s you go the harder they are to to mod back to black panel specs yeah so i'm told i've modded my old pro reverb um, and it ended up standing absolutely glorious. And I sold it for so cheap. What was I thinking? Anyway. Anyway. Yeah. A 40 Watt Podcast is saying a Bandmaster Reverb is basically a super in a head cabinet. Oh, interesting. Oh, that is interesting. Michael Davis, I stupidly sold a Vibralux Reverb. For two and a half thousand dollars in two thousand three, I would have thought that was pretty good price in two thousand and three. To be fair, it would be more than that now. But um, yeah, non aligned says someone can build a Vibroverb clone for a few thousand. Support a good builder. Forget the vintage amp mojo, mojo bullshit if you're on a budget. Yeah, like a well maintained vintage amp in good order is a truly magic thing. Yeah. But then you've got to keep it in good order. And yeah. that's not always easy unless yeah. you know somebody. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. Yeah, good luck. I, I, yeah, I, it's, I found myself ha hammering around reverb today looking either for a hardwired deluxe reverb or some 70s fender that could be, could be modded. But can't we mod the... We've got the... The... That. Basement. Yeah, maybe. That's, that's I think that's prime. very different. Is it? Okay. Mm. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, yeah, anyway, good luck. Good, good luck, luck, mate. Um, right, Brent Porter. Brent, your super chat didn't come through, but l the ever-vigilant BV is on it and has it here for me. Uh, Brent Porter says, crazy how early you have to get in with the super chats now. <laughs> Congrats. Thanks, Brent. He says, uh, I'm putting some Sunbear soap bar sized Firebird pickups into one of my guitars. Mm. What pop values caps for Firebird pickups? Uh, so the Firebird. I don't know. I think it's still 500k, isn't it? Because it's still a humbucker. Sounds like it should be. Yeah, I think I think they're still 500k. And the, the Firebird pickups are bright and chimey. Um, so I'm pretty sure it is, unless it's like something like 350, but I don't think so. Um, yeah, again, we're not being very helpful here, but Google what the original spec on the Firebird was and use those. Yeah. But I, I just stumbled across a few threads here. Apparently Bonamassa uses different pots and caps than the standard. Um, lots of people saying 500k... Uh, 0 0.022 caps, which would be the Gibson standard. Mm. 
Um, I think 500k pots is a good place to start. And if, if you find them too bright, which I doubt, um, you know, then have a look at it. But I think... Yeah. It's quite often that the neck pickup tone cap would be changed to a 0.015, but I don't think you'd need that on a Firebird. For something like a 335, it makes more sense. Mm. But yeah, it's 500k, 0 0.022 caps, I reckon that's that's where you go. Classic, classic, classic Gibson. Yep. Yeah. And um, again, I'm on the thinnest device here, but I would assume 50s wired as well. But uh, Yeah. Because that does seem to give the biggest range of tones throughout the, the travel of the of the pots. Yeah. Yeah. If anyone has any more on that, come in. Uh, Brent says I've googled around on it and I've got conflicting answers, so I'm a little lost. I would go with the standard classic spec. And the good news about pots and caps is they're cheap, right? So if you need to whip a pot out and put a new one in, it's not the biggest yeah. problem in the world. Um. Uh, yes. Uh, Airfire, Ed. Hi, Ed. mate. He says, uh, just a shout out to you guys for introducing me to Mother Space Echo. I had my RE202, uh, an analog man, Maxon OD9, plugged in at the weekend and suddenly 90 minutes disappeared. Welcome to the club, mate. Yeah, yeah I think we can... I think we can, <laughs> That's we can jive with that. <laughs> nice word. James Urquhart. Hi, James. He says, uh, hi, gents. Loved both Mick's exploration of gain stages and Dan's demo of his new board. I'd love to see a show on parallel gain stages. What sounds could you get, for example, with a rat and a TS9? Oh. We, we got a bit into it for a minute there, didn't we? Yeah. Because is it the Empress... Um, Multi-drive. That does parallel. Yeah. It's got a parallel option. Yeah. And it's really cool. It's very cool. Yeah. And of course, in G3, you could do all of that. No worries. Yeah. The, the multi-drive is great. And then the the collaboration between JHS and Boss, which is the angry driver, and there's a parallel ah, option in so that. so there is. Yeah. Which is very cool. Yeah. Yeah, because for, the, for those of you who may be not quite getting that, if you've got two pedals, two overdrive pedals... One slamming into the other, and the order of them will make a really massive difference on how they affect one another. But if when you come into the overdrive pedals, you split and you go into them separately, so instead of being like this, they're like this, and you go into them separately and come out of them separately and sum, you get a very different experience than if they were in series because they go from being like this to being like this. Yeah. But you do need to split and then sum again, and the range of tones is different yeah very touchy like uh you've got two different circuits operating in parallel and if you change the gain structure on one side um it does i mean it's a it's a wonderful way to get really cool sounds but small changes in the gain structure makes massive changes with the end result I've got a buzz. It's <laughs> coming in here. Didn't you? Did, did you? No. I just play really loud, and yeah. no, it's no longer an issue. I've oh, got one. In, I've got one in the in the three, four, five. I it's, can't hear it with the headphones on. No, it's usually a wire that's rattling on the top or right. on another component or something. It's the joy of vintage guitars, Dan. Uh, and indeed modern ones. Brett Tozzi is on, or Totsi. Hi, Brett. Nice to hear from you. He says, um, hello from Charm City. From Charm City? Yeah. Well, I want to know what Charm City is like. The people around, them are like, good day, madam. How are you? Let me not take your person. Would you like a coat to wear? Is it like that, Charm City? Uh, I was lucky to have a lesson with Joey Landreth last week. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, humbling, isn't it? He says, uh, too many nuggets to mention, but I was left incredibly inspired. Yeah, Joey does that. He, Because we've both been lucky enough to have lessons with Joey, and he never, there's nothing about the way that he imparts information 
is anything but inspiring. Because you, you, know, you can sit down and watch Joey play and just go, that, I'm done, I'm not playing anymore. Mm. It's very easy to do. But he is all about the music. And this is not about the guitar playing. It's all about the music. Yeah. And so it's just wonderful. And it's, yeah, really, really inspiring. He's a gr really great teacher, actually. Yeah, because he really knows it. He, he, he really, really knows, knows his it. stuff. <laughs> he says, um, the takeaway, we live in such an amazing time to be able to chat with your heroes. So do it if you can. Yeah. Yeah, lovely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. I'm glad you enjoyed it, Brett. Um, and hopefully you got something really, really useful out of it. Uh, I think we're there. I'm just going to double check that we are there because we okay. may have missed one at the end. And of course, it signed me out. <laughs> yeah. That sounded like the Beatles. Do, 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 do. Isn't the right thing to do? I know I've got to do uh, two step verification. Oh, no. Honestly. I just, it's just, I mean, <laughs> mind you, better than having your account, um, problematicized isn't it yeah actually brett was the last person to super chat so um good thanks very much as always for being here people um we do like hanging out uh <laughs> the corner says uh i tried um mix beans on toast recipe he mentioned recently and loved it thank yous and greetings from germany is that you dan kerner by any chance Dan drive. Anyway, I like the idea of beans on toast being a recipe. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. If I'm on the Great British menu and I do bean by toast, that is my shit and I don't want anyone nicking that. All right? And I'm an artist and I am sensitive about it. Okay. <laughs> um... Ludin 34, Ludin 74, <laughs> Ludin 74 says the Chase Bris Brothers apparently is um, yes parallel parallel yep. as well yeah thank you and for programmable that. yeah parallel yep yeah yep yep okay good uh, thank you for being with us we'll see you Friday very interesting video coming on Friday Dan's interviewed his sister. Um, that may or may not be in the in the set for the upcoming gigs. <laughs> yes. Um, I'd only ever intended that to be a to be a vlog, but um, yeah, I guess. Oh, if, did you? Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I'd never intended that to be a main show, but if that's what we've got, it would. I mean, it might, it might, it is slightly more vloggy, but we actually don't have another show for Friday. Oh, okay. Well, let's see. Yeah. Uh, okay, we can have a conversation about that. All right. No All right. worries. Um, <laughs> annoyingly, we've got a show with Paul Stacey, which is not finished because Paul wants to come in and do some more playing. Right. And we've got a show that we can't put out because there's a product on there that's not coming out. <sighs> so we've sat on two shows that we can't put out. Okay. Which is slightly annoying. Um, and a third show that we can't put out because John Smith's album doesn't come out yet. Okay. So... Maybe I could talk to John and see if we could put his show out this week. Because that's a cracker. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it does mean we get some time off in the future. Oh, I booked a holiday, by the way. Oh, cool. Where are you going? Uh, to see my wife's mother. Okay. Which is in... Corfu. Corfu. Why do I always want to say Cyprus? Because it begins with C. Okay. That's pretty good for me. Yeah. Although to you, it probably begins with S, does it? No. No? No, still C. Is it? Yeah. Corfu. Corfu. For me, not for me, for you. Yeah, I'll Corfu. go see the Jam Boys when I'm there, because it's just a quick hop to Athens from there. I was thinking about going out to see them actually in the, in the holidays this year. 
because they're so lovely. They are lovely. And Athens is a nice place in the summer. That ding was just for you, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. Just to feel and all of that. you out there who, who hate the dings. Okay, Dan, I'm going to tell you that this song is a classic chromatic progression in the key of E. Okay. Bloody capos. So I think it's one, four, five. I'm nowhere near you. Uh, e, E. That's what I mean. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll change to you. Okay. Who's that a tune? Me or you? Yeah. I believe. I did chain this before, I could be completely wrong. With me do that shot. I mean the capo is not helping. No. Sorry for everyone who's turned off. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think it's one, four, five. Yeah. Uh I'll work it out. Okay, it goes like this. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Oh no, it's two actually. Is it? Is it one? One and four and two, five. Eight, four, five, two. It's one, one two, two, four, four five. Four, five, yeah, okay. Get quicker. You know what it's gonna be, right? Let's see if we get copyright struck. I guess now it's time for me to give up. I feel it's time. Got a picture of you beside me. I literally have a picture of you beside me at work. still on your coffee cup. Oh, yeah. I think it's an appropriate use for okay. these guitars. Just a few emotions. Got a bad and shot of dreams. Six minor, leave it. Gotta leave it all behind now. Whatever I said, whatever I did, I didn't mean it. I just want you back. I want you back. I want you back. Go to the coda. And it goes. I guess now it's time. But you came back for good. <laughs> there is no better use for two lovely vintage Gibsons than to take that song. Good night, everyone. See you soon. Fairly well. Great, is that done?